Throughout history, free thinkers have outraged the religious with their wacky ideas about the virtues of free speech, reason, and of course, eating babies. Now, God is dying, and it's time to dispose of his remains. From the pits of hell, Satan sends two puppets of the imperialist West and the Zionist Jews against God, Islam, and tiny kittens to bring you their propaganda and conspire for a new world order. This is Secular Jihadists for a Muslim Enlightenment with Ali Rizwi and Armin Navabi. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Secular Jihadists for a Muslim Enlightenment. My name is Ali Rizvi, and with me is Armin Navabi, who's very relaxed today. Armin, you're relaxed, right? Well, I started earlier. I was prepared, uh, so I, yeah. Anyways. Definitely. He's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's good. So I'm glad you're relaxed. Anyway, so, yeah, t today we have... You, uh, well, let, let people know how much work... People don't know how much preparation and work goes behind making everything ready every day with all the other stuff. That's that's why it's stressful to get all these live streams working. So that's why it's a little Yeah, yeah. Ar Armin actually does a lot of work because what we're doing is we're doing a live stream that's broadcasting on multiple platforms. Not and we also record this and then right. we put it out uh, as an episode for the, the public. Um, the, we do have a website now, secularjihadist.com. Mm. So do go check it out. Uh, if you'd like to support us, uh, we're on patreon.com slash sjme. Once we get to 500 patrons, we're going to start translating a lot of our podcasts into languages of Muslim-majority countries like Arabic, Urdu, Farsi, Malay, Bengali, um, and, and a range of other languages. So, yeah, if you can do that, that's great. If you uh, can't support us financially, that's perfectly fine. Share the podcast wherever you can. Uh, if you like what you hear, uh, then, uh, you know, go to iTunes, give us a rating, all that other fun stuff, and you know. Yeah. Um, We'll, we'll repeat it again. But anyway, to, to dive into today, today we've got like, uh, well, yeah, the, 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 this is actually one of my, uh, <laughs> he's one of my favorite people to listen to uh, when he does that. He's, uh, he's on YouTube and he does a lot of uh, sort of uh, podcast type things on YouTube. I don't know exactly what to call them. Um, this is Habib. Habib is uh, from Saudi Arabia. Uh, he is an ex-Muslim who left Islam uh, back in 2003. Uh, he lives in Dubai now, but he has moved around quite a bit in the area. But I mean, he's speaking to us today from Dubai. Um, he also lived in Canada for a while back in 2003. And he credits, uh, well, he says it was during that time in 2003 when he left Islam and he blames bacon for it. So uh, if you want to, yeah, so he's, uh, he's focus break on Twitter. Uh, that's F O C U S B R E A K, uh, and he is also currently working uh, with a friend of his named Nick Garoff or at Wizard of Cause on a, a sci-fi slash futurism podcast. So, um, and their whole goal is they want to discuss they, they want to add more positivity to the world by discussing things that they really enjoy because of the current landscape out there and you know all of the constant a bickering that you see on social media. So they're going to bring a, a kind of fun aspect to it and, and sort of a repackage the conversation. Um, the podcast, his tw podcast Twitter account is Kebab on Mars. That's at K-E-B-A-B -B on Mars, uh, where they will announce uh, where the pilot episode will be aired soon. So um, anything to promote this guy because he's just addictive to listen to. He's a lot of fun. Again, from Saudi Arabia, born in, is it, is it Katif? Is that how you pronounce it, Habib? Yeah, Katif. Katif. So, so tell us about this. So you, you how, long, how long did you live in Saudi Arabia? Yeah, tell us. I, I lived there most of my life, really. Like I, okay, let me try to calculate that in my head because the first time I moved out of Saudi was back in 2003 where I lived in Canada for a year. I was born in 81, so that's 20-something years. Yeah. I'm sorry, I can't do math. So, <laughs> yeah, af after that, I moved back to Saudi. I lived there for a few years. And then I moved to New Zealand, where I lived there for less than a year. I'm back to Saudi for a couple of years, and now, now in Dubai. I've been living in Dubai since 2013. Yeah, and so you recently, we were talking about, so we we actually were on this, we're going to talk like as much as we can about Saudi Arabia. It's okay for you. I know mm -hmm. that you, you can't openly talk about everything. Um, I think our audience will understand that. They're pretty familiar with that. Um, and uh, you you are soon to, you know, you have a Saudi passport, you're a Saudi citizen. You do have to make visits to the Saudi consulate 
in, in the UAE. Yeah. So are you <laughs> yes. looking forward to your next visit? Is what I want to know. Um, well, yeah, I mean, I, I just want to go there to renew my passport and apply for a couple of visas for my next travels. And uh, hopefully, if they see this, uh, they'll consider keeping my limbs attached because I would rather have them when I travel. <laughs> yeah, Otherwise, yeah. I, I don't look. Uh, it, maybe, just maybe, I can just mail myself to different countries, which is going to require less visas and less paper paperwork. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully, in one piece. Yeah, yeah. we'd like to see your uh, anatomic integrity. Uh, in no, I mean, here's why. Here's why I'm looking into futurism because part of futurism is digitizing your mind. So I can have a backup on my computer, like, oh, they killed me. I can just like download my my consciousness into an Android and just. Well, yeah, no, we've again. all we've all seen Black Mirror, and we know how well that works. Yeah, but but okay. So here's here's the thing. I don't um, let the futurist stuff stay on, and go f- to his podcast for that. Right? Let's focus on. Saudi Arabia. <laughs> no, 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 but I let, do want to. I do want to get into that, but we'll get to it later. But okay, yeah, okay. yeah, go ahead. Okay, so Fine. for for for. Um, Saudi Arabia and and uh, and United Arab Emirates are pretty buddy buddies, isn't it? Like how how safe it is to be an atheist activist right now in United Arab Emirates in Dubai? Uh, it's uh, I would say it's less risky than Saudi. I wouldn't even say it's safe. Uh, the thing with the UAE is, as long as you don't make too much noise, as soon as you, as long as you don't really go against the powers that be, then you should be fine. Um, and I think that's why a lot of the activists in Saudi got into trouble. It's not because they want social reform per se. It's because they want social reform and for their, their royal family to take steps or they make demands or, you know, they raise their voices against some powerful people and those powerful people don't really enjoy it. Now there's, they expect this level of decorum to come from activists. And yeah, it kind of sucks because hey, here's the thing, like I'm all, f- all for freedom of speech. And when you have an activist that is in, like kind of ingrained in the scene since the early 2000s, we've been at this for like more than 15 years now. It's tiring and it's it's hard not to be angry at certain aspects of things. Is it is it, but, it, uh, is it possible to be openly atheist in Dubai as a, a Saudi citizen yeah. that is, okay, yeah? Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. I mean, on the books, it's illegal to be atheist in Dubai, but that's oh. just in the books. Um, I think they haven't prosecuted an ex-Muslim in Dubai since, I think, the 70s, if I'm not mistaken. And if you allow me just a few minutes, I'm going to go on a little tangent here. Go ahead. A few, a few months, I was in a bar uh, a few months ago, and it was just one of those like tiny, tiny little quiet bars. It was just me usually and the bartender and a couple of people. That, that, that day was just me. And there was, there was this one dude, early twenties, just in his like khaki t-shirt and pair of shorts, drinking his beer and getting quite swaying around. I'm like, that guy looks uh, like he needs some company. Let's just have a chat. Maybe, maybe Where is this? him up a little bit. Which country is this? In Dubai. Dubai. Okay. In Dubai. I was in Dubai. You so I pours the guy. I was like, Hey, what's up, man? I mean, you see, he looked down and he's like, no, nah, it's my last day in, last day in, uh, in college. And I'm going to join the army. I was like, oh, sir, so you're, you're UAE citizen. He's like, yeah. I was like, and you're drinking. And he's like, yeah, I'm actually an ex-Muslim. I don't believe. Mm. And there was an ex-Muslim UAE citizen joining the army. Now, knowing most atheists in here, they tend to lean left. They lean liberal. They lean progressive. And you know that the UAE and Saudi is now involved in this war in Yemen that most progressives are against. And I was like, so you're, Joining the army, even though your country is in a war with Yemen, and I know that's from dealing with the ex-Muslim community, mm. most of us don't like that war. And when he told me, it's something that I'm still struggling with. Mm. He's like, I'm against the war and everything that it stands for. I hate it. I hate the human loss. But I love this country and I love the, uh, the, our leaders. And I would follow them to hell and back, Definitely. no matter what. It's that level of sort of nationalism and patriotism that you can see with a lot of Americans, even that they're against the wars in Afghanistan. UAE and Iraq. has nationalism. <laughs> UAE is like a like a, a baby, new, made up country out of nowhere. 
made by well, European yeah. for fa- forces, it, and people still feel nationalistic about something that was built by the Europeans. No, no, Armin. A lot, a lot of people in the UAE um, I actually really like the fact that they're part of a more sort of relatively civilized place because the, Dubai and the UAE are a huge, huge tourism hub. I understand um, that, but it's it's a it's basically a, a country that is a corporate country that is ba- built on. Uh, tourism and and people having fun. Like, how could you be, like, like I mean, I am against all nationalism, but at least like the other nationalists, they have some this this uh, you know narrative of their story of how they you know of of their history of their ancient past of their people. Like UAE is just like made up. Like it's like what are yeah. like what are they proud what, of? What does it look like? What does UAE nationalism look like? What what is it about? It's it's about taking pride in rapid pro- progress and wanting to be the best at everything. Mm. There was an interview with uh, Sheikh Zayed on the BBC. I think it was back in 2011 or 2010. And they asked him, like, the, why uh, are you spending... Yeah, the, the, just yeah. for the audience, yeah. Yeah, it's the head of state. He, he's like, the, he's like the, the leader of Dubai. Like, they call him the Emir of Dubai or the ruler of Dubai. He's basically like Dubai has one state of the United Arab Emirates, and each emirate is its own different state. And the BBC asked him, like, uh, why are you spending so much money and effort on this rapid expansion? You already have, like, you're spending so billions of dollars on having, like, the best schools, best hospitals, but it's so rapid. And what he said is, like, if I can have the best schools today, why should I wait till tomorrow? If I can have the best hospitals today, why should I wait till tomorrow? And he kept continuing with all the kind of mega project that they're building. I mean, yeah, there is a sense of pride right. that goes beyond just uh, the tallest tower or the biggest shopping mall. Like Dubai now, well, not Dubai, that's the UAE. They're leading their own space program. We're launching the, I say we, even though I don't really belong to this country. But yeah, it's like, I feel <laughs> like it's home now. <laughs> you know, yeah. I've been living here for yeah. a while. Yep. But yeah. We're so, launching, so we're nobody, launching the first. Nobody can deny that the United Arab Emirates just out of they built something amazing out of nothing, right? But the thing is that the problem with other form of nationalism is that they take pride in some people that had no, no contribution in something take pride in other people's achievements just because they they are the same race and the same um country right for example like if you're an american nationalist or an iranian nationalist you're like oh yeah my country did that and you're like well did you have any part of that? Like, no, but I feel pr- proud. Like, well, you didn't have anything to do with it. Why are you feeling proud? But now with the UAE, that excuse that, I mean, yeah, UAE is growing fast, but the fact, like, what is it that makes the people of UAE feel like they are part of the same people? Just a, a paper that says that they're a citizen of this country, just because of that paper, now they think like they, they're entitled to be proud of some other people's accomplishments as well. Like, even, I mean, as much as other countries' nationalism makes no sense, this one even makes less sense to me because they don't even have that sense of, yeah, these are my people kind of mentality to, to take pride in some other people's or be ashamed of other people's wrongs or take pride of other people's accomplishments. Like it's just a piece of paper. What, what unites people of unite, uh, of UAE, like that they, they see each other as a one citizens of a country. I, yeah. I, I guess it stems from love and appreciation to their country more than pride and something that they had nothing to do with. Mm. And yeah, the, I mean, yeah, I, I get it. I, I I get the sense of pride in one thing. Like they're, they're launching the first um, the first mission on 2020 is going to be to to Mars. We're going to launch the first actual sort of like probe that's going to study like the climate change in Mars. And right now, there's no probe in there that's studying that. And mm. by the way, the the way they plan the whole thing is that the 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 rocket itself, the probe, the the uh, the satellite, and all the engineering team is a UA, uh, they're all UA nationals. They're all educated in the UAE as well. So right. it's so, like a, it's like, here's the thing, like, I get what you're saying. Hmm. And I, I would be the wrong person to, to defend a sense of nationalism, because like I said, it's a feeling that's so alien to me. I spent my life ever since I was 19, moving from one city to the next, or even sometimes from one country to the next. I don't have a place where I can call really home, let alone a place where I can feel nationalistic or patriotic for. So I would be the very wrong person to defend 
a feeling of nationalistic um, desires or whatever. Like, I, it's just not me. Right. I'm just telling you what I am experiencing here, what I'm seeing from people. Right, right. Yeah, yeah but but there's there's also another element to it is that uh, when you have dictatorships, it's a lot easier to make progress happen. Like you know, if you want to build a hospital, but want to build a big tower or a big a, get a, develop an island. Uh, you just essentially have to say, okay, we're going to do this. We have lots of oil money. Let's just do it. Whereas but you, if you're... But you uh, up easier as well. The, I think... What no, 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 but uh, sorry, Armin, yeah, just, yeah. Let, let me just finish this point. So the, what happens is if you have to go through parliamentary committees, if you have to get multiple parties on board, uh, if you have to get it approved by your budget committee and all of that, then that the, what happens is that your progress is a little... It, it's slower, but... In the end, it's also more enduring. I know that in, in Dubai and some of these countries, some of the big projects and the really ambitious projects have tried to take, there are a few that they had to abandon in the middle <laughs> because they ran out of resources or they were running on borrowed money and so on. So uh, th there's also that element. So, so there's an illusion of really, really fast-paced progress. And uh, these illusions actually play very well. I mean, it's, it's like the illusion of reforms and with that. MBS, you know, oh, yeah, we, we need to get to that reform thing. But before we do that, I was trying to do the segue. No, no but, but that's why <laughs> I wanted to stop you from doing the segue. I thought it was I, pretty good. I thought, yeah, it was, yeah, it was a good segue, but I'm stopping the segue because I have an, uh, the UAE, the reason why it grew so fast, correct me if I'm wrong, this is my understanding, right? Even though it doesn't have much oil or any oil, I think, right? Uh, the reason is that it's the, it became one of the few stable part, uh, stable uh, Arab countries uh, around a whole bunch of other countries with oil. And all the people that were benefiting financially from oil, where would you put your money? Where would you invest your money, right? You would put it in the most stable areas, right? So uh, Dubai benefited from, um, not Dubai, UAE benefited from the instability in the area because everybody was taking their money out of the uh, out of those countries and investing it in a place where it was m a lot more stable and that's why it gave birth to all the financial success and all the progress in the UAE is that is very simplistic and short su summary that represents uh, uh not i would say not really maybe in the 70s that made sense but now i think they most of their growth happened in the 80s all the way through to the mid 90s and then it kind of went to another kind of venue of growth. But it started with a very robust port. And we still have one of the most robust ports in the Middle East uh, here in Dubai, uh, along with a, uh, a trade-free zone, like a, uh, like, you know, like a tax exempt kind of zone where you just can establish any businesses and not pay any taxes to anyone. And that was pretty great for anyone that wants to do business here. Like, okay, I can just pay the tariffs and not worry about any kind of taxes later on. Yeah, you can just come here and just do any business you want. And after that picked up in the 70s and the mid 90s, the real estate business boomed here and it's, it was a very slow growth. And as soon as that boomed, you can just like, you can look at pictures like satellite pictures from the 90s till now, and it was just a rapid growth. Like the area that I live in in Dubai right now, it was a desert in the 90s. There was nothing here. Yeah. And now there's like an entire, entire little mini city here so, so so is it true that in dubai like i hear a lot of news stories where people that commit uh adultery like there was a woman from australia that reported that she was raped and instead of arresting the people that raped her uh she got a, 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 like a, she went to jail for adultery right like six out of marriage you go for prison for it even if you're a foreigner uh and more recently there was this chef uh, that said something about Islam, uh, and he was a very, uh, he was a huge chef, like with a, he was a celebrity chef, and I guess, I don't know what happened to him, he lost his job, I don't know if he got any legal uh, consequences from what he did, but are these, what are, you, what are your thoughts on these stories in, in, in Dubai? I mean, here's the thing, like, I wouldn't be surprised if they actually happened, mm -hmm. I'll be honest with you, because, yeah, we still have uh, some rather aggressive people that are in power, especially like in the judicial system. However, when I trace some of those stories, and I have to be honest, like I haven't really looked into every single one of them. Mm. I looked into some cases and they were all fabrications, either fabrications or hiding some details. Like there was a story that I, that I was aware of and it was like, oh, someone was raped and then they were arrested and put in jail. And it turns out that during the investigation of that entire thing, 
it turns out that part of it was her drinking and getting drunk in public, which is against the law. And they're like, well, you're going to get punished for that part, but they're going to be punished for raping you. So it's a different kind of case altogether. Like, if you know what I mean? But I can't tell you with any kind of certainty that all those stories that you listed are true or not, mm-hmm. because I, I don't really follow all of them. Right, right, right. Okay, but uh, a lot of people just, uh, we are, I know a lot of people are going to comment, well, it's not like Saudi Arabia. Like, yeah, yeah, we know. Like, of course, it's not, it's way better. Of course, like nowhere, uh, the, there's few countries. Uh, I think only North Korea is worse than Saudi Arabia, right? Uh, yeah. Bes- yeah. Besides, uh, can, I, can I just interrupt you for a second? Right. If, if sex outside of marriage would get you in jail in, in, in Dubai, hmm. 97% of people here would be in jail. <laughs> <laughs> well, so can I, like, I want to go to Dubai and people tell me that's stupid. I mean, you're, you're an ex-Muslim atheist, you know, podcast, book and everything. Don't go to Dubai. And like, I hear it's fine to go to Dubai. Is it worth me risking? Like you, you said, would you tell me to come to Dubai? It's okay. Like somebody like me. Worst case scenario. Um, they might reject your visa and send you back. That's the worst case scenario, but otherwise they won't do anything. Worst case. Okay. Here's the sending back part that scares me because I'm a dual citizen of Canada and Iran. Where are they going to send me back to? No, <laughs> when, when, when they <laughs> send you this. back, uh, when they send you back, you get to choose where this could be sent back to. And it doesn't have to be the country where you came from. It's just the country that you have a valid visa to visit. Okay. So you'd be like, I want to go to Turkey. Oh, well, here's a but place to get it, to Turkey. Is go it back. worth risking it? Like, when, like, is it, are you sure? Like, are you, but I want to go to You would be, yeah. dude, dude, you'd be hanging out with me. Is that worth it or not? Come on, <laughs> let's go have a beer together. Okay, okay, I'll consider it. Okay, Saudi Arabia, reform, let's go there. Pivot. So, wait, well, let's, before that, let's, can we start? So you said you were born in Katif and you're uh, another one of those uh, rare Saudis who comes from a Shia background, right? So uh, can, can you tell us a little bit about how, you know, where were you born, how you grew up, uh, you know, just a little bit about your childhood in were Saudi Arabia? Were you treated differently because you were Shia in Saudi All Arabia? That, yeah. Well, yeah, back then, back in the 80s when I was growing up, it was the discrimination was more prevalent over there than it is now. But yeah, let's go back to my childhood. Like I grew up in the, a very conservative family. Um, I think I got most of my nerd enthusiasm from my dad. Uh, which, who was quite kind of like liberal and more into like American arts and, and TV, got me into Star Wars when I was a kid, got me into the Atari 2600 as I was a kid. It was kind of awesome. Until 1996, he went to Hajj and things got worse. He, he stopped listening to music, wanted to ban music from the house. And I'm like, but dad, all those Michael Jackson records that you have, can I have them please? <laughs> so... I, I think um, after that, it just went to a little bit of a darker place. But yeah, I did follow on. I I, I was kind of engaged with it. I started going into a little, I think you would call them madrasas, but they were more like Hussainias or those like places of worship for Shias where they do all the sermons. And I would go there for Friday. And after the sermon, I would just sit with the sheikh and they would just like tell me or teach me about different facts of religion. And I was kind of studying to be a mullah or, you know, a Muslim apologist pretty much for those uh, who don't understand what a mullah is. A Muslim apologist and a preacher. And I, I got so serious into it. I was reading all the religious books. I, I read the Quran like multiple times, uh, the Herd Wasida and uh, a lot of the Sira books. The Tahrir of is uh, that's uh, Khomeini's book, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. Was, uh, you know, Marjaya was quite important to to us. Like having a Marja, which is like a pope kind of figure, and whatever they say is gospel. Your Marja was Khomeini in Saudi Arabia. Jesus Christ! No, I was more of a Sistani kind of guy, oh. but uh, yeah, Sistani kind of guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah we I was also Sistani. The Sistani but, but, but people the in is, Saudi like, Arabia had Khomeini as a Marja. I, well, before yeah, that when, time, when it was, no, it was before the time because you can't have a merger that's dead. And yeah, Khomeini I know, was I know, but I'm, t- I'm talking about oh, okay, but before when he was alive, there were people inside Saudi Arabia that had yeah, Khomeini yes. as a merger. Yeah. 
No wonder yes, Saudi yeah. Arabia was so scared of Iran. So this is uh, you were born in uh, yeah you were born in eighty one right so yeah so I was like it was, we were also Shia in Saudi Arabia, and whenever we went to Medina there were a lot of Shia Saudis in Medina, and they used to take us to Jannat al Baqi to do all the you know the ziara and all that stuff, and um, yeah so they they were uh, the Khomeini was revered by them when he was alive. Just to clarify so, to people in, in Shia, in 12 Shia Islam, in the Vilayat al-Faqih version of Shia Islam, which is the most Shia Islam right now, I know a lot of Shia is going to hate me for saying that, but um, you are yourself... You have that one Ismaili guy going like, no! <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> but 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 you're supposed to, you, because Islam is so complicated and there's way too many rules, the 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 and the logic is that no ordinary person can make sure that they're following all the rules, right? So what you have to do is you you select a marja, which is a religious person with a very good religious knowledge and understanding, and you just check with them everything. Hey, is this okay? Is this Islamic? Can I do this? And as long as your marja, which is your religious leader or follow or the person you're following, tells you. You, this is right or this is wrong. Even if they made a mistake, you're off the hook because you're just following the marja. If they make a mistake, it's not your fault. Just do what. Pick a marja. Pick any marja. As long as you pick a marja, not based on how who's the easiest marja to follow, but based on actually thinking that that's the best marja. Like you can't switch yeah. marja because that marja is making something easier, like making life easier for you by saying something that you want to be okay, okay, right? So yeah. you pick a marja, you follow the marja, whatever the marja says, okay. So yeah. So Tahrir al Vasile, you you did you read the, you read the whole thing? Like that's a massive, massive undertaking. Or did you just it's kind just, of use it? It's just four volumes, it's not much. Four vo yeah, So the fourth volume is the hardest one to find. And I actually found it. I've got the entire PDF because in my book I was I was quoting uh Khobeni, you know, when he said that you can uh, gain sexual pleasure from even an infant, yeah. right? And yeah. how that is legal. Uh, without without having intercourse, I mean the whole it, it's it feels sick even saying it. But anyway, so with thying, uh, that's thying. in that's in volume four yeah. by thying. Yeah. yeah, two pages and a half. So you have to wait. Explicit details. You have to yeah, wait. You have to wait. Basically, what he's Khomeini was explaining is that the the age nine is what you wait for for intercourse. So you you. Uh, when the girl hits age nine, then it's okay to have intercourse. But you don't have to wait for age nine for you to have other forms of sexual pleasure with a girl. That's uh, what Khomeini was saying. Yeah, so he said even a nursing baby. So even this is funny, baby. like in, in, yeah, in my uh, right. extended can, family, can we, they really like yeah, Khomeini, can, right? Can, can, take it back. Yeah, yeah. Can, we, can, we, can we go back? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah let's yeah, go, go back. back. Because, because we, we are getting into to. some like disgusting stuff right now. <laughs> but yeah, I... I the reason I read the Khomeini was because <laughs> this guy, he was to do a podcast to spread positivity, and here we are back. Yeah, he, he was kind of the mentor. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But <laughs> the Khomeini was uh, the mentor of most of the marjas that were alive at the time. So I wanted to see the sources of their of their teachings as well. Right. And I think at the age of fourteen, I would say, or fifteen. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm an old guy now, so I don't really remember that well. But yeah, it was around that age where I started asking more deep questions and significant questions when it comes to the philosophy of Islam and the way it explains the natural world. Because you, you follow the, the story of creation. The first thing that God created was the pen. And then he created a tablet and he ordered the pen to write everything there is, everything there was, and everything there will be. And he called it al al Mahfuz, which means the preserved tablet, the unchanged tablet. Mm. So everything is predetermined, and now they teach us about free will. And I'm like, how do you like how do you consolidate this and this? Like it doesn't make any sense. Mm. And no one could give me an answer. And the story of creation, like we well, again, which means we created everything in pairs. Yet then he creates just Adam. Where's Eve? He created Eve later, like. He didn't say that we created pairs like one at a time. It's like one, and then maybe a few years later we create another. Like yeah, no, he was talking about the pair first. of each. Which who is the pair of Satan? And then I got into like the other like Abrahamic religions, and there was a Lilith, and I'm like, oh, maybe it's Lilith, but they didn't mention her. I don't know. The thing is, like with every single question that I was asking my mullahs and asking my teachers at the time, and they couldn't answer me, my mindset wasn't like, no, nah, this this means that Islam is full of shit. 
for me, it was like, these guys suck as apologists. I'm going to find out the real truth and I'll be a better mullah than this guy. Yes. So, yeah. <laughs> that's exactly. So, so, so speaking that's of a very, just very a, common path to atheism, but, but you know what you were saying about the whole free will and the, the how, how they, how they reconcile that. What I was always told when I asked the same question, like, you know, if we have free will, then how does God know everything? And they, he would, they, they would, the answer was essentially, and they had this logical way of question and answer to get you to this conclusion that you have free will to choose what you want to do, but God eventually knows what decision you're going to make. And that's where the determinism comes in. And when you're 16, that's pretty much you're like, predetermined oh. then. Yeah. Well, that's pretty much God. predetermined then. Yeah. No <laughs> shit. The, the tablet that you mentioned, that's, is that basically the heavenly copy of the Quran? Uh, no, no, no. It's uh, basically, it's imagine like a uh, a tablet that has the destiny of every single creature that was ever created. It's we didn't basically learn about our life's index. We just learned about the fact that the, there was the first thing that was, the, the first thing was not a pen, it was the uncreated word of God, which was the Quran, the heavenly copy of the Quran. What the hell are you? What? First, first thing he created See? was a pen. Huh. And that was actually the, uh, yeah, a pen and but, but tablet. Wouldn't the Quran be, okay, but since the Quran is uncreated, wouldn't the uncreated uh, item come before the first thing that was created? Because the Quran was uncreated, so the Quran was before the no, pen. No, no. Now you are a, a Now you're getting a into Mutazalite territory. No, no, no. 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 He, he's, he's being Al-Jahaz now. If you remember Al-Jahaz, like, he was like, is the Quran created or is it a spoken word? If it's a spoken I'm not word, a it's not a creation. Mutazalite said it was created. I'm I, uh, the opposite of the, wait. No, yeah. but I'm saying now you're getting into the Mutazalite territory. <laughs> Yeah. That discourse. That actually led to it. <laughs> no, but so that's uh, okay. But that's the but the but the anti mortazalite view is now the common view that the Quran was the uncreated word of God. So uh, the uncreated right. word of God comes before anything that was created. So the Quran was before the pen. So the Quran was written without a pen. That. <laughs> <laughs> well, when, when when you, okay. When you express a thought, is that thought part of you, or is it something that you created? Okay. Well, it's. That is that, oh, that's we're what, really that's getting a, into Mutazalite territory. Yeah, that's yeah. Mutaz. That's what Mutazalite say is something you created. That's why the Mutazalite said that the Quran was created by God, not part of God. So and they well, and there they you got, go and they got executed for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So they didn't solve this, and they were wrong, and we're not going to solve it right now because it's none of this <laughs> stuff really matters. It's nothing to solve. Eventually. It's just fairy tales. It's, it's just, just yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it is fairy tale. So yeah. so there's nothing. So and, and so I have I have a question. So you. So you grew up around that time. You're saying that your dad was fairly liberal, even though you were in a religious household and all that. You, did you go to... Yeah, so one question I have is, you said that you went into those Shia worship places, right? The well, We call them the Imam Bargas. Um, but was it a... So so when we used to do these things, like the Majalis and the Sermon and all those things, uh, we used to have to do it very secretly because it, we were in Riyadh, and in Riyadh, you know, how they... They always raided these places. Uh, was that an issue for Saudi Shias? Because I know in Medina they used to have these majalis openly. It's uh, it's uh, it's still been held openly, like for all the time, like in Qatif, Al Ahsa, and in Medina. Like but the East Coast, around yeah. Riyadh, yeah. yeah. But around Riyadh, you no, know, it's it's not. It's kind of frowned upon. And but right now, it's frowned. People right got deported. Yeah. For, yeah, for but whatever. right now they can do it openly even in, in Riyadh because the religious police have been kind of decommissioned a few years ago. Yeah, yeah, they so, have. So they can't do any of those raids anymore, which is which is good, I guess. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I mean, it's it was quite in the open. And, like, and, we, and when uh, you, oh, did you go to? Yeah. You went to uh, Saudi school there. Yeah, I went to Saudi school. And, and it was kind of weird because we were taught like Sunni version of Islam in school, and then we go to the to the majlis or the madrasa, and then we get taught the the uh, the Shia version. It's like yeah, no, I, I, it's, yeah. This, but this is our version now. I always took the 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 Sunni version in school too because everybody knew that it was easier. First of all, it was a lot easier, and the people <laughs> who graded the exams. Uh, they were more familiar with it, whereas the Shia thing, apparently, you, you would get lower scores. So we all did this in new version. Wait, so, okay, too. so you're allowed to teach Shia Islam in, in, in Saudi Arabia? Not in public schools. 
No, not in public schools. But the fact that you could like, teach it, so you could actually... Oh, no, I was talking about Pakistan. Sorry, I was getting okay. getting mixed up. Okay, Over there, okay. you could choose. Okay, so in Saudi Arabia, you could actually have... But you can't... Okay, so you can only teach it to Shias, but you can't advocate for people to become Shia, right? Like, that. that's punishable by death. No. Right? No, it's... It, you, can you? I, I don't know. If, I don't know if it's punishable by death or not. Like, partially. Like, I, I don't know if it's... If you go try think to get Sunnis to become Shias, is there a consequence for that in Saudi Arabia? If you try, if you're a Shia mullah and you try to get Sunnis convert to Shia, because I've seen some <clears throat> some kind of debates on like even national TV between Shia and Sunni wow. mullahs all the way back. Really? Yeah, I did not yeah. expect that. Yeah, they used to do that. The thing is, like the the Sunnis, or not even most of the Sunnis are okay with Shias. It's just the Wahhabis. They're the ones that are like, oh, let's kill all Shias because they're they're just like they're they're waffles and they're, they're just like they're the kafirs and they're they're atheists. So let's just kill them all. No, in the eighties, the Wahhabis were. I mean, there were a fuckload of Wahhabis. Or at least they had a lot of influence in Saudi Arabia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But um, again, it's like you have the Wahhabis and then you have like the moderate Sunnis who are kind of okay with it. Like, yeah, we had some Sunnis in our schools as well. So it's like but, we okay. talk about religion sometimes. It's fine. So, so here's 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 the the way I I learned that you as a, as a dictator or or a fake um, elected official, which is still a dictator, for example, in Iran, the way you try to get the moderates to hate the Sunnis or the hate, get the moderates to hate the Shias is by not telling the rest. So, so obviously the religious people, the religious Shias. Is easy. These are fucking Sunnis. Obviously, they're heretics. Or these are fucking Shias. They're heretics. But the more like relaxed people, you sell it to them as foreign agents rather than just Shia or Sunni, right? So the Sunnis become Saudi agents rather than Sunnis. They're like, oh, Iranians are racist towards Arabs. So like, guess what? These Sunnis are funded by Saudis, and these are foreign agents. That's why we should hate them. Or maybe if you're Shias in Saudi Arabia. You don't hate them because they're Shia, but these are because they're Iran agents, they're foreign agents trying to cause chaos in our country, and that's why you hate them. Is that what you notice or no? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we're still being called, like, uh, Irani agents. And mm. you know what? I kind of blame a lot of the, the Shia community over there as well, <laughs> because their allegiance goes to Iran more than the country that they live in. Like if there was a football match, for example, where Iran is playing against Saudi Arabia, all of them will cheer for Iran. Like that's just a silly example, but it's true. <laughs> yeah. like, really? Uh, the Shias yeah. in Saudi Arabia would cheer for Iran over Saudi Arabia. Dude, that's, it, the proxy war is real. Jeez, that's, yes. um, uh, that's unbelievable. Uh, okay. uh, yeah, and, and then they turn around and they go like, what do you mean we're, we're agents of Iran? We, we, we belong to this country. We like this country. Even though like it, there was um, like back in, I think, 2000, I'm trying to remember, 2014, there was a terrorist attack in my hometown by ISIS. I lost three friends in that terrorist attack. Oh my God. It was quite devastating. And they just blew up a mosque during Friday. I had to fly back to Saudi, see my family and stuff. Um, one of them was a coworker of mine back when I worked there. So I had to see his family as well. I don't know, beside that, uh, the funeral was more of, a, more of a protest kind of thing. There was like thousands of people in the street. And they had all sorts of flag, like all sorts of flags, like from the Islamic flag, you know, and uh, they had like the, the yellow flag of Hezbollah as well, because Shias were kind of proud of Hezbollah for some odd reason. The okay. black flag of Imam Hussein. Wow. Uh, and his flag as well. But you know, out of all the banners and all the flags, not a single Saudi flag. None. And I was so pissed at them. I was like, the organizers, I talked to one of the organizers, like, one of your messages in this, in this entire movement, is showing solidarity with even the Sunnis that are losing people to ISIS fighters and ISIS terrorists, because they were terrorists attack back then, even in, in Riyadh, in Khobar, all over the place. And it was so, sort of like a chance to have some solidarity in the country. And how come we don't have any single Saudi flag? And then you blame people for looking at Shias and they go like, well, they don't belong here. They don't have any, because they don't have any nationalistic or any even sense of belonging to this country. You blame them for thinking that? You can't. 
So, so let's give people some context. The, Sh the Shia minority in Saudi Arabia, they reside over the most oil-rich parts of Saudi Arabia, right? And this is what terrifies Saudi Arabia because Iran's influence over the Shia minority in Saudi Arabia means that Iran has influence over the most oil-rich parts of Saudi Arabia. Like if, the, um, and after ever since 1979 Islamic Revolution in Iran, this has been the major paranoia of Saudi Arabia, or because basically having an Islamic revolution and their scares, their 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 they they got scared again. Their fears became uh, exponential when during the Arab Spring, you know, they they, they uh, when that happened again. So, um, so do you think, based on what you're telling me, based on uh, that the fears of the Saudi government over Iran's influence, the, the paranoia and all that is justified? I would like. I, I don't really think most of uh, even the activists over there would like to secede to Iran. Mm. No, they won't. Like, but here's the thing: like their problem is PR and messaging. Like, when it comes to their messaging, they go like, "We want to feel like we belong to this country. We're being prosecuted. We were discriminated against." And these are my. These are my. This is the yeah. Most these are the, okay. Yeah, the Shias would go like, "Yeah, these are our grievances. Please solve them." But then when it comes to their PR, and like I said, with that, with that, um, that rally that they had for the people who they lost for the terrorist attack, they didn't show any sense of belonging to Saudi Arabia. It's like, we're well, all, it, we're all our own little thing. The, well, isn't it also the government's fault for making it very hard for them because they are this Shia minorities are discriminated against in Saudi Arabia? It makes it very hard for them to feel like part of the country when they are so looked down upon? I would say that most of the, uh, at least back in like in 2014, like most of that discrimination is gone. Like there used to be back in the 80s, discrimination in the workplace, you don't get that much promotions or whatnot. You can't really have access to certain positions of the government or the army. But that was gone in the 90s. Like, let's face it, like it's what's happening in the Shia minority now in Saudi is they ISIS. enjoy... No, they enjoy their victimhood complex. Mm. I had that with my, my manager back in corporate banking in, in Saudi. He was a Shia Muslim. And all the guys in our department were also Shia Muslims. We're going to get so much we hate had, for, this video, for this podcast by Shia, by some Shia. Uh, so I'd let it bring it on, man. You always hate <laughs> I, I, I don't care. I don't care. I'm just going to speak truth of power. And right, right. If Shia's yeah, 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 in love with me. I don't yeah, care. Yeah. Like th this guy. Okay. We had an opening there for an assistant kind of position. And there were at least four very qualified people that come, that came in for interviews. He refused them because they were Sunnis. And he waited until this incompetent buffoon who happened to be from the same town where he is. And he's like, well, he's a Shia. He's a cool guy. Let's hire him. <laughs> it's, and they think that this kind of reverse like sort of, I wouldn't say it's racism. It's like reverse, like the reverse discrimination bigotry. is okay. Reverse bigotry. Yeah, reverse bigotry. There you go. Reverse big bigotry is okay because, like, oh yeah, in the eighties where we're discriminated against, but this, these <laughs> four very bright young gentlemen, they should get the brunt of it. They shouldn't get the position because I don't know. When I was a kid, I didn't get that job. It doesn't make any sense. This is like, this, this sounds like bigotry. the conversations that people minorities have in the United States. This seems like exact the same exact conversation now. Yeah, yeah. Like the over over like okay, I'm not saying which one, who's right or who's wrong, but it just seems like the overcorrection. You're talking is, is kind of like a pendulum swinging too too far to the to correcting the wrong. Is that is that what's happening? No, right now there's no pendulum swing. It's like um, let's uh, whoever like let's say. Anyone from that older generation, if it's a Sunni guy, he would only hire Sunnis because, like, fuck the Shias. And it's the same with the Shias. Like, once they get to a certain position, like, let's hire all Shias because fuck right. the Sunnis. <laughs> and it's only a few people in the middle going, like, can we just stop? Can we just stop? Right. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, uh, Razib, uh, or sorry, Razib. I mispronounced your name last night, last time, Razib. Uh, Razib Khan uh, is asking, who is the most prominent Saudi Shia? Is there anybody who's made it big? Um, wasn't the guy that they uh, killed? Wasn't that the mom that yeah. they, killed, they killed him? So what was his name? They had I, a huge I, funerals I, I, for him um, in Iran. Yeah, and his son was imprisoned I, as well. Yeah, yeah. It's okay. on the tip of my tongue. Goddamn. 
Yeah, why did why did uh, I? Yeah, I slipped why, on his why, name too. Why, it started with an N. Why why you look why you looked that up? I'm gonna mention to everybody just to give everybody some context after the. So when when Khomeini came to power in Iran in 1979 uh, revolution, that had a huge impact on Saudi Arabia, right? Uh, because Khomeini's message originally was sold not as a Shia uprising. It was sold as an Islamic uprising against monarchs rather than a Shia uprising, right? And the Saudis and and Khomeini became popular not at at beginning. Eventually, he was only popular among Shias, but at the beginning, he was popular among all Muslim, many Muslims around the world because he was standing against the U.S. against the superpower, and he seemed to be winning and winning and winning. So people were liked, and a Muslim saying, you know, standing up against the United States. And, and seemed to be defiant. So he became very popular, but his anti-monarch stand, and uh, he, he, he was trying to spread this message of revolution. Like Khomeini was not at all a nationalist. He hated any praise of Iran. He wanted Islam over Iran. He wanted this revolution to go beyond the borders of Iran. And in, mostly, and one of the main parts was Saudi Arabia uh, and Iraq. Uh, and that's why Saudi Arabia funded the Iraq war against Iran. But, uh, Saudi Arabia was, was terrified because, well, they were monarchs and Khomeini's mo message was all monarchs need to come down in favor of the Islamic vilayat al or the Islamic community need to, Islamic scholars need to lead a nation, not monarchs. Um, and, uh, and what, uh, Iran also did, but when they had radio, programs in Arabic directed at Shias in Saudi Arabia, telling them to rise up against their dictators. Um, so, and, and guess what? We had the, the, the people that did rise up were actually Shias. A lot of Shias ri ro rose up, but Saudi crushed them in the 1980s. Uh, but also some Wahhabi people rise up and they took over the Kaaba with guns. And there was a there was a shooting at the Kaaba because the, the sense of Iran started a sense of revolution yeah. everywhere. When right? was this? Was in 1979. Ex 1979 on the same, on the same yeah. year of the revolution. The, the, when the revolution they happened, they went and took over the Kaaba, and there was a gun battle, and the, and the Saudis the Saudis got that guy and defeated that guy, like they killed him. But they were so scared that they decided that they need to give in to the Wahhabis. Just to let you know, the Saudi Arabia was born out of the marriage between two families. The House of Saud and the House of Wahhab. One of the the, the daughter of uh, Ibn Saud married the Wahhab guy, and then basically the the two families merged, and the, that ma that marriage also brought Saudi Arabia. So this re this relationship, the Saud, the Sa the House of Saud represents the money. Uh, the House of Wahhab represents Islamic fundamentalism, right? And they always had this. They always needed each other, but they always had different pri different priorities at the same time, right? So every uh -huh. Saudi Arabia was moving away, becoming too close to the United States. Islam became Islamic fundamentalism wasn't becoming that big of a deal until the 1979 revolution in Iran. They they decided that okay, we need to make sure that we listen to the Wahhabis so that the revolution doesn't happen, and that's why Saudi Arabia became extremely fundamentalist, and the rules and all the crazy stories that we hear started from there, and it had uh a huge. Yeah. Iran and Saudi Arabia, both of you guys. <laughs> yeah, I was, but oh, I just, so, oh yeah, Pakistan so, is so innocent from all of this. No, I was gonna <laughs> say, I was gonna say that this we can't decide. We can't decide. Pakistanis can't decide whose but, asses they want to kiss more. But Pakistan, the Arabs or the Persians. Yeah, but the Pakistan, <laughs> but Pakistan was the side effects. Pakistan going crazy was also because Saudi Arabia, because Iran started exporting its revolution in the Shia parts of the Middle East, in Lebanon, in Syria, in Iraq. So Saudi Arabia uh, uh, Saudi Arabia started building madrasas. madrasas in the, uh, their Pakistan. their yeah. reaction was to do the same thing with Wahhabism, and that's how f Pakistan got fucked, right? Yeah, and the and the U.S. was they they had they really had no idea. But they're like, oh, we can totally get behind Saudi Arabia because yeah. first of all, they're fighting against the godless Soviets, yeah. and then uh, and you know supporting Iran. that war, and also they're, and they're against, against Iran. You so know that the great Wahhab United States loved Wahhabi fundamentalism at some point because they were against the two main enemies of the United States, which is the communist Russia uh, and Iran. So what's yeah, not yeah. there to love? 
But I just think it's hilarious that they so they just the Mujahideen. The, 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 I can't get over this. Mujahideen who were like heroes for Ronald Reagan. I mean, the Mujahideen means people who waged jihad. They were totally behind it. They were totally yeah, behind Reagan the process called of building. Freedom and they still they did not get the way that uh, the Middle East geopolitics works, and they still don't. It's still. They're still so completely clueless about it. It's incredible, uh, but uh, but uh, Michelle Abdullah in the in the patron chat has um, uh, mentioned that it was Nimmer, right? Like the the Shia yeah, Nimmer, guy Nimmer. was killed, right? Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah no. so Nimmer, Nimmer. Uh, he he was he was uh, executed a few years ago. And uh, now, if you want any prominent Shia Muslims, Shia Muslims that are in Saudi, look up someone called Munir Khabbas. Um, he's a Shia thinker. And he likes to debate against like Sunnis and atheists. Huh. Although his 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 uh, debates and his his arguments are kind of shit. Can we get him on this podcast? <laughs> <laughs> um, imagine like a a, a well mannered Kent Hovind. That's number number. Mm. Oh, okay. Yeah, so, so, so does he speak English? Not sure. Not sure. Huh. A, a lot of them do, but they sort of pretend not. Like MBS, I know MBS is the first sort of Saudi leader that I've seen speaking English in uh, internationally. Like sitting next to Trump, he was speaking English. But a, a lot of the royal family, that's, I know, I yeah. They, when I when I was in Riyadh, I met a lot of a lot of the princes. Like you know, they go to the same. I went to the American school, so they used to like hanging out with the American girls and you know all this stuff. Uh, so they. Um, yeah, they they all spoke English. They were all sort of foreign educated, or even if they're not foreign educated, they would travel a lot overseas and very influenced by the American culture and everything. So, uh, but but they would in publicly they would always speak Arabic. It was interesting. But did you so so you went to school? A lot there. Of I even know, with King Abdullah. Uh huh. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. What were you saying? No, King Abdullah was uh, was like even in his international. Appearances, he would speak Arabic, and I remember um, and King Salman is the same. But yeah, I remember yeah, King awesome. Fahad. King Fahad back in the day, like uh, during the Second Gulf War, he spoke English a lot, especially yeah. when there was a coalition all building up in Saudi. He addressed to the world in English a lot oh, of times. Yeah, I, yeah can, I I missed that. But can you tell us about MBS without getting uh, chopped up in the in your in the consulate? Like I know you have to go to the Saudi consulate, but what can you tell us about uh, MBS? Like don't tell us anything. MBS. Yeah. Uh, okay. MBS, when he was first getting into the scene a couple of years ago, like everyone from Saudi was well, had can, a little bit of glimpse of tell, hope. Should we tell people what we mean by it? I know most people know that watch this podcast know, but yeah. maybe we should tell people that are new here. MBS. Who's MBS? First. MBS. Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia. Right. Go. Good. And uh, he is the next in line when it comes to being king. Right. Even though he consolidated all power around him, so now he's effectively the ruler of Saudi. Right. However, like when he first started coming to the scene, there was a lot of promises. He promised a lot of reforms, social reforms. Um, oh bullshit! And he opened up. Yeah, he opened up to a few activists here and there. He uh, he and I, like there were a few little victories here and there that kind of popped up in the last few years, allowing him to thrive. Something that I've been act an activist for since two thousand six. I didn't really think that I would see it in my lifetime, but that happened. Yeah. Opening cinemas in Saudi. A lot of you Westerners would be like, cinemas, you're happy about cinemas. Well, yeah, it was something that we asked for for years and years, and I mean, now it's it, happening. Yeah, there, were, there were no cinemas in Saudi. There were, there were none. The, like the, the first movie that you guys watched was the Emoji movie, wasn't it? Like, that should be a human rights crime right there. Was that? The, uh, was, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Was that? Hey, that I live in Dubai, so I don't care. I, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But anyway, go ahead. Okay. So. So yeah, and I think the uh, the the one part of his like the, that made the most noise was when he when he put all the uh, a lot of businessmen in in like Earth Carlton, like a pseudo jail, put them in there for house arrest, and he started like. In bed, like either it's embezzling money or just taking money that they took out of the government out of corruption. We're not sure. He came up with a bunch of billions of dollars out of that. Yeah. Now, as for so, as for someone who worked in corporate banking, I can tell you for sure a lot of the money of those businessmen as was actually embezzling from the government to begin with. I don't feel sorry for them, and I know there's a lot of Western media that 
try to paint it as like, oh, he's just embezzling them for money. No, that was money was that money was stolen to begin with. I don't feel any sympathy for any of those guys. So it's money going back to the government. I'm okay with it. The now what I have a problem with is the methodology that he took. There was no due process, just put them there and have them sign a release letter of like, hey, I'm just gonna send this money to the government and it's billions of dollars are just being transferred now. I don't like that. And then after he started with his religious reform, like stripping all the powers of the religious police, for example, announcing that he will remove most of the religious teachings from schools, where right now kids in schools have religious classes, I think 15 periods per week. And he's gonna like shrink that all the way to two, where it's all gonna be about peace and love, nothing else. It's like, yeah, just be peaceful and be nice to others. Nothing about religious teachings or jihadis or how to divide your livestock to to pay the zakah. None so, of that. So did you read that in your textbooks when you were going to school? All of that? Because I had some yes. of those passages are, and, and I have described them. I've actually quoted many of them. First grade books, fifth grade books, 12th grade books. In Saudi Arabia, I've quoted them in my book as well in, in the very first chapter. Like kill, killing infidels and you know never making friends with non-Muslims. What? Okay, so you, you read all yeah, of that. Ki killing infidels. All there. What age in school you learn that you're supposed to kill infidels? I think you start learning at fourth grade. That's uh, when you're eleven. So yeah. eleven you, you, official public school textbooks for eleven-year-olds in Saudi Arabia teaches you that you're supposed to kill infidels. And does kill it, infidels, gays, Jews, all, all of that. that. Oh, the the Jews thing is was all it was on TV. You couldn't avoid it. It was and, all the time. Yeah. And and how, yeah. okay, so in a world that is so sensitive about anti-Semitic stuff, how did the United States like? How is this? How did this not get more attention? Uh well, you know, uh, it's just their culture. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But yeah, going back to MBS, going back to MBS. Oh, like, so, so wait, that, is that, 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 is that, that going back to MBS? Is that not there anymore? No, they're they're revising the new textbooks, and so, I think they're going to be in in schools next year with new textbooks and everything. Yeah. I, that's I haven't very, seen the new textbook yet, recent, though, but they're going to be removed. Okay, that's very yeah, yeah, that's very recent. And is that because yeah, of I mean, the Wahhabis that they're taking that out? And yeah, that's exactly when the Wahhabis started rising up. Okay, and there's there's more than a hundred of them in jail, and even though I I hate Wahhabis especially the extremists and the radicals with every fiber of my being. But everyone that spoke against him from the Wahhabi side was put in jail. They just disappeared overnight. And that was the first warning sign for me. So like, they, dude, okay, I, 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 I understand. Yeah. Like, I understand that you want to protect your own revision, but you can't just put people in jail because they disagree with you. These people are voicing their opinions. And unless they go out in the streets with guns and go like, no, you can't really take us down, you don't put them in jail. But but there was, was also another was, element. Of was, it. it was also a power grab, I, right? I'm, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna do some you know I self promotion here. This whole thing was bullshit to me from the beginning. I knew that I knew that this guy was worse of all of these other people that everybody was talking. I, he's he, this MBS guy from the day one. I knew he was going to end up being worse than all the Wahhabis fucking combined in Saudi Arabia. Okay? Even when his old reform bullshit came out. But anyways, go on. Did you, by the way, did you say the helicopter, the one when he killed somebody and they, they had dragged his body in the helicopter and then somebody recorded it on his, did you see that video? That was, that, that was one of the early I, days, the warning signs for me. I haven't, I haven't seen that. I was like, this guy, this guy is a fucking, this guy is like, a, like, I was scared. I was scared of this guy from the very beginning when it started. Like when I saw the videos of him moving people around, people just disappearing. People just like, yeah, this is this is not how you do reform, okay? This is just this this whole reform, this is vision twenty thirty bullshit. This is all just cover for something a lot more evil. But yeah, go on, sorry. Well, I mean, vision twenty thirty. Yeah. Oh, hold on, vision twenty thirty yeah. uh, has nothing to do with this reform. It's basically an economical reform. Yeah, well, and it's a reform. As much as as much as I as much as I disagree with his social reforms and his methodology, vision twenty thirty. Still has a lot of good ideas. We need to get out of the oil business in Saudi. Okay, no, no, no. It it has it has a lot of good 
pointing out our problems with solutions that are so childish and imaginary money flowing, you know, like it's no, okay. It's just value overvaluing things. Yeah. It's easy for me to say like, Hey, you know what Saudi Arabia needs? Getting out of oil, having more, uh, free enterprise. Okay. What's your plan? Holy shit. This plan is stupid. You're over, you're overpricing everything. This is not going to happen. Like, obviously it w- it was just a childish play at just making, putting like lipstick on a pig and selling it to the world. It was all just a PR move. There was no economical plan or anything behind any of it. There was like any, any, anybody that, oh my God, I'm so, I'm going to get so angry right now at this. It was so obviously no, our PR move. Uh, do, do, do you have any specifics that you want to criticize? You're just calling it stupid now. No. If you want okay. to talk economics, no. this, I'm, I'm, okay. I've been a banker for like seven years. Well, so have Give I. It to me. So have I. The overvaluation of um, um, Aramco. Oh my God, it's on. It's not only Iran and Saudi Arabia, but it's like uh, <laughs> two bankers. No, come on, like the valuation, are they going to privatize? Um, what am I spelling, pronouncing it right? Uh, Aramco? Right. Yeah, yeah Aramco. 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 Sorry. Right. Uh, like anybody that looked at the, 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 what, what that, so the main thing is good. They're going to sell that. Uh, they're going to pr- parts of that and that's going to fund a whole bunch of things. If you just looked at the, the oil prices that had to make that, uh, so that price sustainable, the fact that they had to open their books for anybody to come even ev- value that company and they were never intending to open their books, the amount of transparency that needed for that, for anybody to come, to come and even value that company was something that they would, that, that would, bring up like shine a light on so many clo- uh, skeletons in their closets that nobody would have ever been comfortable with uh, with make, making that company any of that go public right and uh, but it was a it was a pie in the sky valuation like anybody that had any sense of well, um, estimates for the where oil prices are going to go uh would tell you that and the amount of, yeah so that's that's what i mean i read- yeah have you have you go ahead okay oh, go ahead. So your your issue is with the overvaluation of Aramco. And yes, that's that one, one of the many different. things I had. I mean, I had. A, I I can. I can. I thought it was my turn. Yeah, yeah but let, no, let, let Habib, 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 go ahead, <laughs> Armin. Sorry, sorry. Let him. Yeah, sorry. let him go. I, I know. I know it's your podcast, dude. But come on. Okay. No, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. sorry. O- overvaluation, and yeah, the IPO didn't go through. I don't really think the IPO is going to make as much money as they want, but I, I think most of the evaluation, most of the money will come from the PFI initiative. Now uh, the private investment initiative. Now that's that might work, that might not. And I think part of like the vision twenty thirty, like yes, it's a pie in the sky. Right. It's good to dream big. If you if we get just twenty percent of that into Saudi, that's still a good progress. Because oh, yeah. here's the thing, and yeah, you can be you can be cynical all you want. You can be cynical, and yeah, I, I've I've been cynical for a while. But when you have someone who's at least trying to do something instead of just going with the status quo for all the 30 years that I lived in Saudi or been in Saudi for having someone who tries, even if it's MBS, even though I have my criticism of him, even though I mistrust a lot of things that he does, having someone who tries is still a net positive for me. Okay. So to, can I, may I, may I? Go ahead. Okay. So obviously I would be supportive of Saudi Arabia diversifying coming out of this thing. Right. But it would, it should have happened under somebody other than MBS, right? A lot of the, a lot of this, a lot of other than the valuation, obviously, yeah, diversifying is good. Getting out of the oil industry is good. What I think is that this, if anybody other than MBS did this, it would, they would have done a good, better job at it. Uh, the, one of the key things about uh, Vision 2030 is that we're going to be more open. We're going to be more transparent. We're going to value human rights more than before. Like it's going to become more free and stuff. And you can see from the very beginning that this was just lip service. Like, oh, women are going to drive, but hey, we're going to imprison women activists. But even before that, like just p- putting people, like locking up people, locking up all your political co- uh, competition. That's not the atmosphere you want to create for making vision, something like vision 20, 20, uh, 20 30 happen. By the so, way, a so lot, of, I, a lot of the I... things about vision 2030 was, pi- I mean, I, I, you're agreeing with me on that. So I, I, I'm saying, but what I'm saying is that this is something that should, first of all, diversifying out of oil is something that Saudi Arabia has no choice but to do. It's not like something that, oh, let's, let's do it because it's a good idea. 
this is going to be something that's going to be forced on Saudi Arabia, not something that somebody has to pick up or else it's not going to happen, right? So they're not, you know, they're, they're going to run out of sources of revenues. The, the market is going to force them to move in that direction anyways. Uh, but, but MBS, like the, the, what happened with MBS, if, if, if the, fu- the, 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 the crimes in Yemen, the locking up of political opposition, f- female activists, this Khashoggi case or whatever, we don't want to, we don't have to get into that, but made it so that it became the most worst politic, worst PR nightmare for Saudi Arabia. That anything, anybody not doing, anybody else, just by not doing these things could have made it a much better outcome. Even though the 2030 was way too optimistic, I think you're you're saying even if you could do 20%, I'm saying maybe you could have achieved 30% or 50% of that if it wasn't done some under somebody with such, it wasn't done by a fucking psychopath, right? Okay, uh, Habib, Habib, go. Uh, so, no. Habib, I wanted to add one thing to that before you go ahead. Uh, is mm-hmm. that the uh, this whole thing about you know putting everybody under house arrest and the Ritz Carlton and everything? Uh, wasn't that also a power grab in the sense that I think the Saudi royal family there there's different aspects of the family that uh, are in charge of say military, are in charge of intelligence services, are in charge of like as domestic stuff. I I can't remember the details. And what he did was he kind of uh, did a power grab to, to to basically take over all of those departments, which is sort of unprecedented. Yeah. That was also Pretty an aspect much. of it, right? So, but but anyway, yeah. go ahead. Um, yeah, he, he ended up signing a, a royal decree with his dad that's consolidated this like anti-corruption committee that only he gets to be in charge of. However, I get why you're cynical over MBS, over this stuff. And I am cynical as well. I'm overly critical of the guy. However, when you say that it could have been done under someone, anyone else, maybe he's not really aware of the history of Al-Sauds because the others are even worse. The others are much, much worse. Like, mm. yeah, you see this guy, he just chopped up a, uh, a, uh, mm. allegedly chopped up a, uh, a, 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 you know, a, a journalist in some consulate. Uh, he probably just put some people in jail and some people go like, oh, they're just activists. He goes like, no, they're just, uh, they're traitors. Now, at least he put them in jail. The others would have just killed them and their family. No. No, no, no. Wait. It happened. It wait, 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 wait. Okay. Let, let, sorry, go on. sorry. Yeah. Yeah. It happened Let under me. King Abdullah. It happened under King Fahad. It happened under King Faisal, where entire families disappeared overnight. So maybe to me, like maybe for me, I'm kind of, I don't know, desensitized to this kind of stuff. Like it's part of the course for me of being a Saudi. Like, yeah, this stuff happens. And I know it's kind of cynical. It's morbid, but it's, it's just part of our reality. It's disappointing to see it from MBS when he was kind of promising at the beginning, but it's not surprising because we're kind of used to it. Okay. I get your when anger. I really do, lesser, but I'm kind I, of used to can it. I, can I say something, though? I, okay, first, sure. of, so first of all, I don't think anybody was ever as, ever as bad as MBS because of the whatever you think about what he did to Saudi Arabia, what he did with Yemen is not just... Um, it's not just unprecedented in Saudi Arabia, it's unprecedented in our lifetime, okay? The amount, of, the human rights violations in Yemen uh, by this man, I mean, he was already extremely ha- more hawkish when it comes to his anti-Iran stance, which is, ju- I mean, ju- I mean, I understand the anti-Iran paranoia, which is justified, but the way he went about it, it was way more hawkish than anybody else. But the Yemen way, started the, the, before, Armin. It wasn't he like started, he accelerated it significantly, but no, started before. I mean, it was. Uh, that's what I'm saying. He accelerated it. He did the moves, the the kidnapping of a prime minister of a fuck of another country. Okay. Oh, the, the Hariri. The, yeah, that was the putting the putting Qatar under isolation, thinking that this is going to crumble them, which backfired on them. Uh, you know, the everything he did backfired. Everything he did was so much more hawkish and so much less intelligent, even by Saudi Arabia standards. And this whole Yemen war just is just makes everything else that we talk about the Khashoggi case, the the what he did in Lebanon, what he did to Qatar. Um, all of this, uh, what he did to the active uh, feminist activists in Saudi Arabia, all of that one side is not, t- does not even come close to 
what a monster this person has this person has been when it uh, comes to people in Yemen and the war crimes committed against them. This person knowingly used starvation as a weapon against innocent civilian, including thousands of children. Even by Saudi standards, this person is way worse. Way worse. Where, where, where do you think it is now, and where do you think it's going to head? Or head, considering everything that's happening now with MBS, uh, Habib. I mean, speak oh. about it to the extent you can. We don't want to get you in trouble. Um, no, no, no. I, I, I know, and I can't really go into details. I mean, I, I think it's going to just. He's just going to meander on. I mean, he still has, has his allies by the balls. Like, he, yeah, you remember Trump. I know that you love Trump. Can just say during your tweets about him. Uh, yeah, yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> just to be clear, clear just to be clear Kushner to the people that are new, new here, that was a joke. No one here is a fan of Trump. Go on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but, but Kushner is the guy who just... recommended him, right? Who recommended, uh, uh, who got Trump to start backing MBS? Yeah, the thing is, like, yeah, he's a. Uh, like Trump during his campaign, he was all like, yeah, we need to limit our relationship with Saudi and all that. And the first thing he got, he did, as soon as he got inaugurated, his first international trip was to Saudi Arabia and he bowed to our king. Uh -huh. That's what he did. So yeah, he has a lot of his allies, a lot of his powerful allies by the balls. Is he going to tone it down? I'm not sure. After this Khashoggi stuff, it's a PR nightmare, even for, even for MBS. Uh, he's either going to double down just to, you know, assert dominance, or maybe he's going to just, you know, tone it down a little bit and be like, well, let's be a good boy now. Especially with the kind of stuff that happened in the G20 where people are throwing shade all around. A lot of the partners that he was counting on for his Vision 2030 are pulling out, especially with Europe. Well, he was, he was yucking it up with Putin, though. <laughs> like, he seemed pretty Putin relaxed. Putin was only part of it. He, he okay. Vision 2030 relies on partnerships with companies like Uber, countries like Germany and France, uh, and the UK was also part of it as well. So, yeah, it's not just diversifying the economy, it's also diversifying your economical partners. And a lot of those economical partners are pulling out of whatever plans that they had with them. I know that Uber already pulled out. They're like, we don't want anything to do with you. Um, Every company that hasn't only, pulled out of this should be shamed to the end of time. But go on. Yeah, okay, yeah. Go I mean, he, he has, like, he's losing big parts of his vision now, especially, like, part of his vision, like, one of the one of the stuff that he wanted to do, and one of the things he wanted to do, and I disagree with it, but I see why it's economically viable, is manufacturing weapons. And he had planned partnerships with companies from the U.S., Germany, and France to manufacture and design weapons in Saudi Arabia. It's, yeah, it would make us a lot of money. I don't like how they're going to use it. I'm not into weapons. I get why the plan is solid, though. And now he's losing most of those partners, and I think only Lockheed Martin is sticking to it. Fuck. Fuck. I'm so, just... yeah, I mean, I, here's the thing. Like, if he doesn't tone it down, he's going to lose... That part yeah. of his plan. Loki the Martin is too big to care about PR nightmares, but go on. I, I know. So I think it would be smart of him to slow down and kind of like try to be at least resemble someone who's, who cares some, about human I rights. I think someone's going to kill him but, in his sleep soon. Okay. Uh, did, I mean, here's the thing, but assassinations in the Al Saud family, like a, a lot of our kings were assassinated before. King Khalid was assassinated. King Faisal yep. was assassinated. I would not be surprised. Wait, King, King Khalid was assassinated? He wasn't assassinated. I was, was there when King Khalid died. It was the guy before that. Uh, Faisal was assassinated by his nephew, right? Or something like that, a family member. Yeah. Khalid died of like a heart attack or some shit. Like I think that. somebody should saw, bring a bone saw when they when they kill MBS. Okay. <laughs> no. What? Oh, sorry. Uh, no, that's what I'm saying. You don't. You're not endorsing what I'm saying. No, but no. but 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 he is. Uh, <laughs> but he is at risk, isn't he? Like that's a very like uh, there is a lot of internal 
uh, like a lot of people from his own family are pissed off at him. Like he knows he knows that he locked them all up in the Ritz Carlton. He's a fucking thirty three year old kid. He's I mean no offense I don't mean to be ageist but like he's like, that's the least of anybody's problems right now. But I mean he locked them all up in the Ritz Carlton. So he pissed them all off. Right. So initially people with loads and loads of power. So he he knows what he's doing. He knows the risk that he's at. He, right. He so knows it. I think that's what I'm saying. Like given how he like how he locked every Everybody, how he locked up a lot of billionaires in Saudi Arabia and these people have connections these people know people and now that he's becoming less powerful I think the greatest threat to him is not um, is not Iran is not United States the greatest threat to him are members of his own family okay now. okay 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 the, the United States is the opposite of a threat so Habib I want to go back to that thing you said that he's what got is, his allies by um, the balls so it, it essentially what happened was when Salman had his uh, what was the other guy knife the the other guy who was going to come in was the yeah. previous crown prince. Um, no, United States opposite uh, of threat. I mean, like the United States pulling out the support. That's no, 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 no. The, the, no, the United States is still support. Trump. I know, is still I know, but yeah. no, yeah, but the Senate's just. I, is is going to be less still support is going to be there, it's, but because will, of the Senate, it's just going to be a little bit less, which yeah, is yeah, significant for Saudi Arabia. Yeah, but you're on. right. The CIA report came out and all of that. I, yeah. I understand that. Yeah. But what's what's essentially the way that this guy came to power and the reason that he thinks he's invincible? And tell tell me if this is true or not, to be. I mean, uh, do you have again a 33 year old guy who's not even the head of state? He's just a crown prince. And he thinks that he's completely invincible. So what happened was that initially, I mean, this is all in Bob Woodward's book too, that uh, Jared Kushner befriended him because they're around the same age. And Jared Kushner is the guy who advised Trump to go to Saudi Arabia. This is the first thing. He's like, Saudi Arabia is the main thing you have to go to, you know, because of the proxy war with Iran, how, you know, they were, they're trying to go against Iran. And Jared Kushner is family friends with Benjamin Netanyahu. And there's so many other, you know, uh, it's, it's a very, very complicated kind of thing. So he goes over there, they hang out, they they chill until four in the morning, like, you know, uh, drinking whiskey or whatever the hell they do over there. And uh, MBS is suddenly, you know, has this huge endorsement by the Trump administration. And to this day, he's being defended by them. doesn't matter what the CIA says, doesn't matter what the Senate wants to do, the Trump, and it doesn't matter how big of a PR nightmare it is. He's got that. So that sense of invincibility the fact that he's going out and he's doing all this shit, thinking he can get away with it, and then going and high fiving Putin at the G twenty and all that. I mean, isn't is no, there what scared. role? He's scared wait, wait, right wait, now. But my my question is, that'd be what what role do you think? Do you think that if the U.S. endorsement wasn't as strong, if he didn't have that, do you think that he would feel this sense of invincibility that he could do whatever he wants to? Uh, I think that he relies too much on his economical sort of uh, influence on the oil market. Because right now, one thing that is like, one of the main things that is holding the dollar as the the currency that has been used to trade in oil is that it's pegged to most of the Gulf currencies. It's pegged to the dollar, it's pegged, it's pegged to the right Saudi Arabia, uh, the Emirati Durham, to a certain degree, I think 90% is pegged to the dollar, right. uh, the Bahari Dinar, and Saudi has a lot of influence here. Imagine if we change that instead of pegging our currency to the dollar, to the euro. The dollar would not recover after that. I think he's relying too much on that. I think the dollar would recover just fine within a decade because, yeah, trading in, in, in oil is not going to last for long. Like, give it at least, give it most 20 years and we're going to move on from having oil as a main sort of... Um, Can't sort wait. Of Oh yeah, I can't wait either. Um, but yeah, I think, that, I think it's going to be a Chinese. It, 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 it won't be euro. It would be a Chinese currency. But go on. No, I'm just saying, like as an example, yeah. pick it to the euro, pick it to something else. Like it, just something to imagine or something to think about. And also, the, the Americans still have a lot of businesses in the Middle East. They have a lot of um, uh, a lot of bases in here. They they do make a lot of money out of the Gulf region. So just. Kicking out all the uh, Americans that are living here, just being paid by being just sitting around in a base doing nothing. That would that would hit them hard. Uh -huh. So now, are the Americans going to recover? Yes, of course they're going to recover. They have a, a much stronger economy, a more diversified economy than Saudi Arabia right now. But I think MBS and his administration uh, is relying too much on that aspect of it. And also, well, they, they also. Uh, go ahead. Sorry. No, no. The finish. Finish what you're saying. 
Yeah, and also when it comes to especially this administration, the Trump administration, any administration that's going to come afterwards, the Saudis are pretty good at offering them very lucrative business deals like, hey, it's Trump. Want to build a Trump Tower? Oh, hey, it's the Bush. Oh, yeah, we have a lot of these these oil mega conglomerates here. Let's award some of your buddies some of our uh, some of our contracts. Like mm-hmm. Bush and his oil buddies made a lot of money in Saudi. Yeah, yeah. And Everybody makes so- a lot of money in Saudi. I mean, that's that's a thing. I, I, yeah, I I think that there's a there, there's and people tend to make this mistake. I, so during the Obama years, this is something that a lot of uh, conservatives um, don't like to admit, and many of them don't even know, is that during the Obama years, actually, the U.S. became more oil dependent ever than before. I mean, and oil independent. So they actually did get off of Saudi oil quite a bit. So now I think it's about it's less than ten percent the amount of oil that that, that that the U.S. gets from Saudi Arabia. However, um, what I think some people don't get is that Saudi Arabia still has a huge um, influence on oil prices. So they can just decrease production to a certain amount, and um, you know it, it's going to affect everything. It's going to affect the prices of oil. It's going to affect the stock market. Ultimately, it's going to un- affect unemployment rates. So, so that's another way of really, really having uh, everybody by the balls, even if you're not getting most of your oil from Saudi Arabia. So, they, they I, I, that, it feels like there's Trump support. Trump support if they do. Yeah, yeah, there's. I mean, there's a lot of. Uh, yeah, I know they. Yeah, it, it's. I, I just think it's very complicated. I think that that sense of uh, invincibility that MBS has that he can get away with anything. I mean, this 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 journalist killing thing. I mean, he got away with it. I mean, I I, I don't think whatever the Senate says, whatever the CIA says. I no. do you really think it's gonna? Uh, I, no, I, I, I mean, think this is the first. You have I've never seen Saudi Arabia so care so. Ch- now changing their policies, coming or talking about peace in Yemen. I've never seen them so. Yeah, because be- they're de- they're dependent no, on foreign investment. I know, I know no, and but, it's easier but, to hold them to account. But. No, so, so, okay. It, it's one thing to say, okay, justice is never going to be served. He's going to get away with it, but his life maybe. But the fact that is that all of this has devastated Saudi Arabia has devastated Saudi Arabia but this question is so it's so sad to me that the Yemen crisis didn't devastate Saudi Arabia but this Khashoggi guy devastated Saudi Arabia but whatever it takes okay they have the investments pulling out the vision 2030 was already a, a something that would never have happened but now it was is completely because of all this is completely do, do you want to hear a really cynical view no but, I'll tell you, i'm no, going to go, me, I'm gonna go really cynical let, let me finish I, this but yeah, yeah, i'm just ahead. saying this this whole narrative that this did not affect saudi arabia is totally wrong they have never been this much under pressure but go on Sure, I agree that they're under pressure, but my I, I'm really cynical, and this sounds a little insane. It might sound like a conspiracy theory, but I think that the uh, the way that they did this, all the details that came out, the, the gruesomeness of it, all of that, uh, all the the gory um, story and the details, and the guy listening to music, and, and you know all of that. It, this, I, I think that there was a, a a benefit to them getting this leaked out. I think it helped because. It's basically well, it, yeah, because it it the message is that if anybody does this, and if you go no. out and you start writing oh against my us, God. So, no, it's I, much I, much scarier. <laughs> no, I so disagree with you on this. I don't even know where to begin. They, they, I, they, they that's kind of what they do in a lot of these dictatorships. The, the reason that they do Ali, things they so ca- brutally they, they is have, because they want to create an example. They have paid for this in I, mean, I, I know you probably can't comment on this, but. If you they want ha- us to have, go down a okay, different topic, let I'm gonna, us know. I'm just going to respond to Ali. The, <laughs> the price that they paid for this is in trillions, okay? Anyways, uh, Habib, what, a lot of people in Iran think that uh, are saying that MBS is going to bring down the House of Saud and they're cheering for the House of Saud to come down soon. Uh, I, I, I know you already said that's almost unlikely, that's very unlikely, but what would you say to the people in Iran that are cheering uh, House of Saud falling? I just, uh, if you, no, if you can read Arabic or get a Google translator to read Arabic, just check Saudi Twitter. Yeah. There's no way the House of Saud is going to fall because of this guy. No way. They still have tremendous support from the Saudi people. Okay. Yeah. Uh, another, okay, wow, really? A tremendous support. Except uh, how yeah. powerful are the, Wah- the Wahhabis hate him? Is that right? Is it safe to assume uh, the Wahhabis hate him? The radical ones that are all for, you know, um, that miss the days when they were in power. Yes, they do. 
but most Wahhabis, at least like, there's like different grades of Wahhabis, like the ones that were in power back in like the days of uh, the other kings. They hate them because they lost their power. But there's a lot of them now that are kind of just running the core where this is just like running apologetics for whoever their ruler is. How powerful are the Wahhabis right now in Saudi Arabia? Not as powerful as they used to be. Are the Muslim Brotherhood a threat to in Saudi Arabia right now? I don't think so. They've never been a threat. A lot of people are saying they are now a, a threat to Saudi to, to the House of Saud more than the Wahhabis. Is that just fear mongering against uh, Qatar? Uh -huh. No bullshit. Yeah, no, That's it's not. Um, okay, so another another question. One uh, one more question, and then I'll get Ali to ask a question. I have a very big question at the end. Uh, but this one, this whole Turkey versus Saudi thing right now, a lot of people are comparing it to the battle between like the Ottoman Caliphates or whether the Arabs should be the Caliph. Uh, like, is that have anything to do with any of that? Because remember the uh, the Turks stole the the Khali the Caliphate from the Arabs. At some point, and this is um, they see it as the same ri historic rivalry as they had before. Yeah, I, is that I feel just like the Turks? Yeah, it, I feel like the Turks care about this more than the Saudis. No, but is it is Erdogan? Like, <laughs> yeah. No, so that when it comes to Sunni, the Sunni world, uh, Saudi is considered like the you know the leader, the political leader of the Sunni world. Is Erdogan secretly wanting to be the political leader of the Sunni world, and this is. A move in that point. I know this is probably just people just get, uh, coming up with poetic explanations that makes things more interesting. But I wanted to see. What yeah, you it's it. It's, it kind of reminds me of people when they compare different rulers to different houses of Game of Thrones. Like, <laughs> oh yeah, and the Americans are the Lannisters, and these guys are like the Hobbits. Oh wait, different franchise. <laughs> but yeah, it makes no sense. But here's the thing: like Erdogan likes to appear to the rest of the world as the moderate voice of the Islamic world right. because he thinks he inherited some sort of like this legacy of the Ottoman Empire. He still thinks like an empiricist, like a, right. or an imperialist. Um, with the al Sauds, they don't really give a shit. It's like, fine, have your, have your empire cosplay or roleplay or whatever, like, do your thing. I don't care. But yeah, he's trying to score some political points with this, mm. especially that he's He's one of the few people that are is he like by the way if, if i want to fly from here to israel for example like israel would give me a visa an entry visa pretty easily but i can't get a flight from anywhere around here in the gulf i have to fly to turkey and then to israel mm. like it's one of the few islamic countries that does business to israel that has like an israeli embassy there but um but does he have ambitions so, beyond turkey as a leader like to muslims do you think i more like I don't really think he wants to be there more than an icon or mm. a like he wants to be like Germany is to the EU like they mm. are they're an important voice and I think he envies like the old voices like from old oligarchs like remember Hafez al Assad you know uh, Bashar al Assad's father mm. I when he when that guy used to show up at the um, at the Arabic League whatever he says goes like all the other leaders respected him. And I think someone like Erdogan looks up to those people and go like, I want to be like those guys. Because right now the Islamic world doesn't have any strong voice like that. Right. Ali, I, I uh, ask if uh, I, I have more questions, but I want to let Ali to get in a few questions. Yeah. So yeah, we have a, we also have to wrap up in like 10 minutes. So hopefully, uh, okay, so, why don't you go ahead? Okay, so so here's what, one thing I wanted to ask you question about regarding this whole reform thing. One of the main problems I have with the style of reform that people like MBS, like even if he wasn't a um, psychopath and he wasn't like a, a, v a major violator of human rights inside and outside of Saudi Arabia, this top down level reform is something that has been tried uh, in history many times and failed. Um, when, when reform comes, when liberal, you know, liberal values come from top down and you tell people like, here are the new ways that we're going to live by. And uh, the, the problem with that is that the, the, the person that is giving that could easily take that away as very, as uh, well, right? It's not something that is built within the society. It's not built within the uh, mind of the people that people took it instead. It was given to them. And, and it usually has, um, when it's forced on people, it many times has a major reaction to it that sets things back. Like, 
if you look at like um, the Western, the forced Westernization in Egypt, that that was there c- trying to copy the Enlightenment, and instead of uh, what th- this is years back, and then it, it happened in. Iran under Reza Shah when it became forced secularism. In fact, it wasn't secularism at all because they were forcing women to take off, like hijab became illegal in Iran, right? So they called it secularism, but it was anything but. Um, like basically is looking at the West, trying to copy what the West looks like rather than actually seeing how the West got there, which, which was the enlightenment values. It wasn't just it, it, it's pretty much putting lipstick on a pig instead of actually building the foundations, right? The, like Re, when Reza Shah brought, tried to make Iran secular, the free speech aspect of it was not there. The, the sense of people being to question authority or protest was not there. These were the foundations where enlightenment came to Europe. Not It wasn't because of the kings gave the enlightenment, told people like, hey, live like this now, right? And then, so, and again, the backlash to Reza Shah was the Islamic revolution. The basically the victimization of uh, Muslims gave, gave birth to the Islamic revolution. And now if you look at Turkey also, this is a slower reaction compared to Iran, but Ataturk also had the top down secularism, forced secularism, forced enlightenment value, instead of changing the mind, like going into the people and building it, building the foundations from the people, having a bottom up approach rather than a top down approach. And now Turkey is becoming, again, Turkey, uh, Turkey's forced secularism had left a huge bad taste for any secularism among a lot of Muslim, Turkey, Muslim, Muslims in Turkey, like the word secularism sounds something like dictatorial now among enemy people in, uh, in Turkey. Uh-huh. And, and now the, the going back to more Islam, Islamic government is a slow, is, is what I see is as a slow reaction to that. That what I'm suggesting is, is that reform is, comes from the, needs to come from the people and demanded by the people and taken by the people rather as a as a gift that could be given today and taken away tomorrow that's that's i completely a... agree with you oh. no, i completely agree with you 100 percent. there like there's no argument there um the reason why uh a lot of activists were kind of excited for mbs when he first started coming to the scene was because he was answering stuff or like agreeing to stuff that we were asking for for more than a decade. Mm. Women driving, like I said, it was a campaign that I was involved with since 2006. And to see it happening, I was like, like, yeah, all of like the other um, anti-human rights, uh, like violations aside, Mm. that was a reason for me to be excited. It was a journey of 12 years that was finally over. Like, yay, we got something. Um, cinemas in Saudi, even though I wasn't really part of that movement, it was active since 2009, I think. But it, uh, yeah, I, I was busy with other stuff. I didn't really care about cinemas. I don't really watch a lot of movies in the cinemas to begin with. So yeah, I, I get you. But with these kind of two points, the people were asking for them, and it already was given to them. Now, the reason why a lot of those reforms fail in a lot of the Islamic world is because of a simple mindset that Unfortunately, in the Middle East, North Africa, and even some Asian countries, we still believe that the people should serve their rulers and not the other way around. Mm. So once we were, were able to change that, and that has to be a, like, there has to be a change between, like, from two parties, like from the people and from the rulers. They have to change their mindsets. Like, I'm not here as a ruler to be served by you, I'm here to serve you. And the people have to be able to question and be willing to question their rulers because, hey, we put you in charge, you answer to us now. But yeah, but that that p- has, that's not, that's not even a thing. Like, let's face it, most Asian countries, that's not a thing. Middle East, not a thing. Right. So that a reform, you- from the, the reform from the bottom down requires that to be a thing. Exactly. So before that becomes a thing, it's, it's not gonna happen. Well, that's exactly so. So the demand for elections, demand for democracy, I think, needs to come before anything else because anything you get might be te- anything else you get, it, it, it could be temporary, right? So now, the, now here's, what, here's the thing: like when it comes to activists, political activists in Saudi, like most of them wouldn't want the outsiders to just disappear overnight because 
they still have a lot of support, especially with the the a lot of the um, more powerful tribes within Riyadh. So unless you want to go through a bloody conflict that would, might last for like decades, and it's most likely going to end up with the activist side failing, that's not a smart move. That's just being strategic right now. So we already have a pseudo parliament that's kind of useless. We call it Mr. Sashura in Saudi. And yeah, they gather up and they talk about stuff and, and then they, they might happen or might not. Uh, so we want to empower Mr. Sashura. We want to be able to vote for people in Mr. Sashura. Yeah. And it's basically a parliament system. Leave the Saudi royal family as an iconic sort of royal family. Let them just do the PR for the country. Let them have their decrees every now and then. We'll have their, like, they'll have our respect and maybe some, maybe a little bit of reverence from people who like them. Mm. We're fine with that. Even I'm fine with that. But I want to have more power as a person, as a citizen, to, to change their laws of my land. And that could come through the parliament. I mean, if which it, is Mr. Shashura. Yeah. I mean, a fake majlis, a fake parliament is, is still good because now you have something so, that you could focus on turning it from a fake majlis, a fake parliament to a real parliament. To a real one. To a real one. So I mean, yeah. like, now, so you have, now you have an entity where you could actually now turn into something real. But I think what you're saying is basically goes into, uh, I mean, the support, the people's mentality, that needs to change. So the, the active, this is why I support bottom-up activism, because before anything can, that could change from the uh, at the top, people's opinion has to first change from the bottom. And that's what you have to do. That's what you have to go and reach out to people and provide them with content. And again, uh, shameless plug: this, if you if we have five hundred patrons, this podcast would be translated to Arabic. So support this podcast. That's what we're trying to do: bottom up activism. But yeah, again, this is this is this is the type of activism that is needed. This is the kind of, I mean, t- translations to Arabic. Uh, both and from Arab activists to English and other languages so that their voices are heard. So people know that, hey, there's people actually, there are ground activists in Saudi Arabia anonymously trying to change things. They just need the platform. They need more attention. They need more support. So translations need to go both ways, I think, uh, so that they get a voice. So I think this is what we need more of. Like we need to lay the groundwork for something bigger to change. And that's where you come in as well as an activist, actually. Yeah, I, I think um, most activists in Saudi need to organize better. Right now, we don't have any sort of form of organization. A lot of people are just lone wolves in this this wild, insane it, battle it, that we're having. It has gotten better from, I mean, there was nothing um, just a couple of decades ago. I mean, I, I think that it has gotten better. I know that it's still, um, I, I well, let me put it this way. I was like, I, I met uh, in, in Boston, there was this one, one of a girl from Saudi Arabia came to this, this talk I was doing. And, uh, there was this other girl there too, and they've been friends for a very, very long time. And they didn't know that the other was like agnostic or atheist. They, they had no idea and they'd known each other forever. Hmm. So, so they're even with their own friends, like they, they, they don't talk about some of these things in terms of, you know, what they think or what they believe. But, it has gotten a I, lot better than it was Can you read before. the live chat by Michelle Abdullah in the live chat? Yeah, it says, there's no civil society in Saudi. The government made sure to undereducate the citizens when it came to politics. So without all Saud, Saudi people will be in a worse shape. Social organizations yeah. are banned too. Is that, is that yeah. what do you think? I mean, social organizations, like having a, a physical organization with its own building and whatnot, yeah, that's not allowed. Hmm. But, hey, social media can just open a Facebook page. What are you going to do about it? Yeah, just uh, there's a lot of underground places where people about, meet up and organize. What about her first statement? Is that true? There's, that there's no civil um, society. The government has ensured that their populace becomes undereducated. This is something that applies to dictatorships everywhere, actually, or even non-dictatorships. In mm-hmm. a lot of cases, they try yeah. to keep their their people un- undereducated. I uh, mean, I, I think um, I think it's gonna change since King Abdullah. King Abdullah started a thing. I, I I don't know what his purpose of it was, but he wanted like to sort of. Uh, educate the Saudis better. And he kind of realized that most of our colleges suck. If not, oh, wait, not most. All of them suck. They just, <laughs> yeah. They're just atrocious. Mm-hmm. So he offered 
And it's the offer still on. Like for any high school graduate, they can apply to any university around the world. And as soon as, as, so, as long as they get an acceptance, then all their fees, all their travels, and everything from A to Z is paid for. That's why you see a lot of Saudi expats all over the world in universities. Not in Canada. And that's starting. Lost them all in Canada. Yeah, no, but that was one of the things that they wanted to take away. Canada was. Ontario was getting a lot of money from Saudi students, man. They yeah. were like, because this was foreign yeah. fees. They were getting a but, shitload of money from it. Go, so they yeah. knew that that would hurt. You were saying, yeah. So, yeah, um, that is starting to actually pay off in Saudi, where you see all those people that were sent off mm. to study all over the world right now are coming back, sometimes with master's degrees, PhDs, and whatnot, starting businesses, starting to get into higher positions. And that is not going to like pay off. In society, right away, it's going to take a generation of these people, and then they're going to construct their own schools, and then we might get a better educated society there. But yeah, it was it, a good first step. But even even that was kind of complicated uh, because I was, I was reading a lot of these things. My father was a professor at King Saud University for about eleven years, ten or eleven years, King Saud University in Riyadh, and uh, it was only male Saudi students, as it was back then, that that were. So uh, what they did was at that time, they just had expatriate professors. So they had foreign you know, professors that were like uh, the Indians and yeah. Americans and Bengalis and all that stuff. And uh, as the Saudis went overseas, got educated and came back and started replacing them, right? The, the landscape started changing. But then what happened is it turned out that the foreigners used to work their asses off. They used to work late. They used to work really, really hard because they felt they had to. And the Saudis who came back were tended to be more chill about it. They wanted to go home at a certain time. They wanted so that that um, ended up uh, becoming an issue too. But like mm -hmm. I, I like you said, I think that's probably just a single generation. That's gonna, it'll take a, a little while to change the the actual. Yeah, and and actually, you make a good point because when you're given your entire scholarship without any effort on your own, you just go to school and everything is paid for. That kind of. Uh, gives you that sense of entitlement like mm. dude they're mm. just gonna pay for everything for me oh and they but, party here like crazy i think the next yeah. generation studies are gonna have like a, a shock when it comes to uh what's expected of them like i think a whole generation of studies went through life not having everything handed to them having a very comfortable life without working hard and now the next generation coming in or even the this generation going through a transition of higher expectations, I think a lot of them are spoiled and this is going to come as a shock to them. Is that accurate to, f to expect? Or what do you Yeah. Think? One of the things that they started changing with the scholarship program is if you don't reach a certain GDP, then you're going to be sent back no matter what. Oh, oh yeah. Well, you built your entire idea. life over there for two years? Like, no, your GDP just got less than like 4.0 out of 5. Hmm. You're coming back. No more scholarship. You mean you. GPA, so, right? You banker. Oh, G <laughs> GPA, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's still early in the morning. Yeah. No, that's, that's a very Saudi way to think. But yeah. you know, I got to say, um, so I want to kind of uh, close with this and one more thing that, that Michelle does have a um, a point in the sense that these changes are slow. So she's saying without the House of Saud, uh, the society will be in worse shape. In the short term, yes. The, the problem with this stuff is it has to start somewhere. So you have a society, like I, let's give the example of Libya where, where I lived as a kid. Is that Gaddafi? It was a seventy percent of the population was under the age of thirty. They had never seen anything but Gaddafi for forty years. This guy had been embedded as a dictator, um, and once you take him away, they don't really know anything else. So it takes some time, and by some time, we don't just mean oh, three years, nothing's happened. Ten years, nothing's happened. No, it takes a much, much longer time uh, for stuff to reach started... some sort of equilibrium. Uh, it, it, no, th th that that is how. Sort of generally, whenever you have a change I, from societies, that I don't know, man. Like look at look at Germany. They went through World War Two. They went bankrupt, and within less than one generation, they became the richest country in Europe. Yeah, yeah but look Germany at Japan. also had a look at Japan. They had two bombs, two atomic bombs, drop on them, and they were bankrupt yeah, as well. No, and I, now I, they I were most you. like I, I, the second highest GDP even uh, in in the world right now. Yeah, within no, no, less I, than I, one I, generation. How did You're they right. Do it? I, like, I, yeah. No, no, no. I've, I've, I've made the exact same point as well before. That you know, there's a 
the, the way that we do, and you know, with the with the, the Muslims and the Arabs and everything, they're throwing shoes at dictators, and that's a bit. Those are the you know the heroic things they're doing in comparison. But uh, but there is something to be said for you know in terms of when we're looking for a change to happen, you have to first set the wheels in motion, and it takes a little while for the wheels to start turning. I and mean, we're not talking. You're talking about Japan, and you're talking about Germany, but we're the, the Arab Spring was like just seven years ago. Right? No, so come it's, on. The Arab, the Arab world has gone through hundreds of years of uh, playing footsie with enlightenment values, and they they still have it. The thing is, that it's the values. You're not going to take off. You're not going to uh, sort of supposing the Saud family goes down, Saudi Arabia becomes okay, a democracy okay. tomorrow. It's not going to change in the next just ten. Years. It's going to be yeah. You very, know why? Because the because That's the foundation it. is not there. And what are the foundation? The the right values, right? Look at yeah. I agree with you. That, so, That's the change I'm talking. I'm about. I'm just saying with the right values, the poorest countries could come out of a uh, worse situation and become the you know become very advanced. And with with the wrong values, the most richest countries could go down. Uh, a, a very dark uh, path. But uh, the, o- the only, co- the only, the best example you could look at is North Korea and South Korea. And look at how de- they followed different models and different values and how different they became, even though they had same history, the same, they, they had exactly the same area, the same geography, the same background, the same everything, different values, different values. Look what each country, w- where each but country ended up. Habib, at. Habib, what do you think? Yeah. Any thoughts on that? I mean, like I said, it's, uh, yeah, I understand the whole thing with the values. And I mean, I agree with you both on all this. But the thing is about empowering people right now, even if they have the values or not, they're not empowered. And I think, yeah, it's, it's easy for us to go like, well, who's the dictator? Let's get rid of them. That's, that's going to be a bloody conflict. And you know what? I'm, I'm tired of conflicts. I, I was born in the 80s. We were in a war with Iraq at the time against Iran. And then the, I remember, I still remember the, the, uh, the Saddam missiles landing in my hometown. So I'm sick and tired of conflict. You too? That's There's my first memory. Way. Saddam, Saddam's missiles, Saddam's rockets dropping on Tehran is my first, is my earliest memory. Oh, uh, we have those scuds. So, yeah, in it's, Riyadh as well. Yeah. <laughs> really? Yeah. It's, Okay, yeah. Wait, why did why did Saddam drop bombs on Riyadh? I didn't know that. Well, 1991, the, 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 first the, Cold War. Wait, what? Yeah. The Persian Desert Storm. The Persian Desert Storm. Come on, man. You keep commenting about the Middle the East. Persian you don't know Gulf the Persian Gulf War. Desert Storm? The first 1991 when Iraq oh, took over. Oh, 1991 with the Kuwaiti and the stuff. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There were Scud missiles that were coming. I was, there were, I mean, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. The I was like, missiles used yeah, to go yeah. up and take them down. Like, it's like a fireworks show. My and, mind is 1979 mindset where Saudi Arabia and Saddam are on the same side yeah, against no, Iraq. No, 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 no. Yeah, the yeah. first few well, days, people would hide in and they had their walls yes, taped yes, up and they had gas masks because they thought it was going to be chemical weapons then after a few of those things they yeah, started yeah, going yeah, yeah i know bill clinton the and all the everybody got yeah. it was Just the most see. it was the most beautiful the world getting together against the, against the dictator but but, and, but yeah, yeah have you were saying yes, the iran rock war yes, here's the thing like yeah I, i'm tired of conflict so i don't want to like advocate for something that's going to lead to another conflict and yes getting rid of a dictator right now especially in gulf states is going to lead to a lot of bloodshed uh, there is a better way to do it, strategize. Like I said, most countries in the Gulf, they have their own parliaments. I think Kuwait has a very active parliament, and yeah, they can dictate laws and whatnot, and they're doing pretty good. Well, I mean, not perfect, but they are advancing year after year. And I think activating that parliament in Saudi would be a better idea, or a better yeah. at least goal to strive for, instead of just going like, Let's get rid of all Sauds. That's not going to go anywhere. That's not going to happen. Especially with, let's say, the majority of Saudis are still in support of, of you know, keeping the Al Sauds anyway. You're not going to win hearts and minds with that message. No, I, I, did, I didn't have that message. I, I agree with you that the parliament that supporting. No, no, no. I, 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 I'm, yeah. I'm telling that to a, yeah. a lot of activists because I see a lot of activists online that's just because Al Sauds, you know, they have these anti-human rights, you know, um, activities here and there, and they're like, yeah, let's just get rid of them. You're not going to win anyone with that kind of message. Right. Strategize. Okay. Know what you're talking about. Okay. And that's it. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, Armin, exactly. last thing. No, can you I just tell up. you my, my, my uh, Saddam's missile story? Just very quickly. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Okay. So um, I, 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 I want to hear your, your story as well. How was your experience? But I, I, one time when I was uh, a lot old, older uh, than the memory, um, 
I told my mom I have this dream sometimes that you're you're holding me in your arm. My mom is holding me in mom uh, in her arm, and I'm in the balcony, and she's pointing to the city, and she's telling me, Armin, look, fireworks. And she told me that that's not a dream that really happened. And I th- think it was just two or three years old, and she said that that wasn't that wasn't fireworks. I told you it's fireworks. That was just bombs, Saddam's bomb dropping on, te- on, on Tehran. But I wanted to make sure you're not scared, so I was told you that's fireworks, right? And this is my earliest memory. Like people tell me that it's it's rare to have an a- memory from age two, but I remember that. Um, so yeah, my earliest memory, and uh, that's when apparently that's when you become self-aware. Your earliest memory, people, some people say that's that's the moment that you became self-aware. So my earliest memory is of of Saddam's bombs dropping on Tehran, but that was way before oh. the the Saddam started turning on Arabs. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, uh, nineteen ninety 1990 to nineteen ninety one was when the conflict happened. Like back in my village, there was a Canadian tank. Right at the border of the village. <laughs> right. There was a lot of anti missile um, installments here and there. Um, I don't remember much of the missile strikes. Like, we had a basement in our house where we made it into a bunker because, yeah, the, the worry about chemical weapons was real and it might happen. And I come from a large family. Like, I was, I was one of six kids. And mom was kind of overprotective. Dad was like, nah, they're not going to do anything to us. We're going to be fine. Mom wasn't taking any chances. Mm-hmm. And you know when you're when the person that you trust with everything and with all the fibers of your being is so scared, you can't help but to be scared as well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Of course you like would. we would we would we would huddle around the radio in that in that basement and just wait for the message, like all is clear. Mm-hmm. Are are you still in touch with your family? Have a sigh of relief, miss- like everything is fine. Yeah. Hmm? Oh no! I was gonna say, are you still in touch with your family? Okay, Do you I'm still visit? One last stuff? question after this. One last question after this. Um, not really. No, I don't try to talk to them much. But yeah, th- those were my memories. I remember like packing my Nintendo every single time there was a missile strike. There was you know, like I'm taking take it to the basement now, and my mom would listen to the radio in the back while I'm just playing Mario or something. Yeah. yeah. Turn off the lights at night. Uh, just one last question. So when 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 Saddam turned on Kuwait, the whole world got together. And like, well, not the whole world, but the international community came in and defended and they pushed Saddam. And it was a shock to many people, even even the United States, they couldn't believe that they managed to build such a coalition, such an effective coalition against Saddam. And it Bush was senior. Yeah. Yeah. Bush senior. So they, so the, the, the fact that the, my question is like, if the whole, if the international community managed to so effectively get together to defend Kuwait against Saddam, why couldn't that? Why couldn't something like that happen to protect the people of Yemen? Uh, because the U.S. is still not f- a fond, not pretty fond of the Houthis. That's that's pretty uh, yeah. much it. Yeah, the, the U.S. is backing the war, Armin. So over there, that what happened is that the U.S. went and got the coalition together because they're the ones. Like what George Bush Sr. did, and then like Obama kind of followed his example. He modeled a lot of his foreign policy after George Bush Sr. is that he went and he built a coalition, he got the support of Arab states, he got a UN resolution, then he went and did it because the U.S. wanted to do it. This time the U.S., uh, including Obama and including Trump, they, but they, they're they actually on the Saudi side against the Yemenis. So that's why it's not right. happening. Listen. Yeah. Uh, th- so before we close, I just want to let everybody know about your... Uh, uh, the the upcoming podcast and uh, yeah. it's about it's a sci-fi slash uh, futurist one you and Wizard of Cause at Wizard of Cause uh, Nick Goroff and it's going to be called Kebab on Mars. Okay, so we're going to put that in the description. Have you discussed? Uh, other- have you guys in your podcast have you discussed uh, immortality and when when are we going to be able to achieve that? Is that the topic in one of your episodes? Well, yeah, I, I wrote it down here, and it's I have a lot of. A lot of notes on that, actually. Yeah. yeah. What are your three three favorite futurists? Is Ray Kurzweil one of them? Futurists. Um, I would name two, not three, because I can't really think of a third one. And they're both YouTubers. There's a guy called uh, John Michael Godier, and he does these uh, these ten to thirty minutes videos. It depends, and he has his own podcast called uh, 
Event Horizon. He's pretty damn good. Like he interviews a lot of uh, sci-fi writers and whatnot, and he contemplates a lot of things like um, life at the at the universe or the Fermi paradox or alien life. And the other guy who's the main inspiration behind my entire podcast is a guy called Isaac Arthur. Now, Isaac Arthur has a speech impediment. Like he speaks like Elmer Fudd. Like if he talks about alien worlds, he would pronounce it like alien worlds. I'm not even kidding. That's just his speech impediment. And he has a channel that's approaching 1 million subscribers now because his topics are amazing. He dissects... It's uh, Science and Futurism by Isaac Arthur. Just Google Isaac Arthur, you'll find him. Did Isaac Arthur, is that a pseudonym based on Isaac Asimov and Arthur C. Clarke? No, that's his actual name. Oh, Jesus. Right, that's pretty. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's pretty uh, rad. All the isn't stars it? align sometimes, don't they? Yeah. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah, and the thing is, like, he would, he wouldn't just contemplate like an idea. Like, we have the idea of, let's say, uh, a revolving sort of um, ring where we live in. Now he would contemplate the kind of society that would live there, the kind of evolution that a, a species of humans or a part of humans that would live there for hundreds of thousands of years. How would they evolve? How would they? conduct commerce how would their communication would work and he would go on these like <laughs> almost one hour videos into my new details and it's quite astonishing like his his body of work is amazing mm-hmm. now the reason why i didn't really think about doing a podcast early on i i know how to lead a conversation i mean you've been on my podcast i i do mostly interviews i talk to people but i'm not the kind of person that leads a conversation i stutter a lot i sometimes forget words Sometimes I just like start a sentence and then in the middle of the sentence, I start another one. I'm yeah. not a well-spoken guy. I, I'm I, I think you are. Well spoken. You are. You are really good. I think you're incredibly Hello. well-spoken. No, I, I, dude, I, I work in production. So I, I critique myself as if I'm critiquing someone who's a professional sort of broadcaster. So I'm just like, I look at myself like, I need to get better. And then I meet this guy, Isaac Arthur, who yeah. literally speaks like Albert Fudd. And he's so eloquent. And I'm like, if this guy can do it, so can mm. I. Yeah. Yeah. So bug it. Let's just let's just dive in. Well man, I'm I'm looking forward to it. Kebab what, on Mars. Uh, can, it's gonna be Can you tell me what yeah. you think about when we're gonna defeat death? What is gonna happen? Do you think it's gonna happen in our lifetime? I think there are people that are alive now that will live to be over two hundred years old. Yes. Yes. Okay. I agree with you. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Not okay. quite immortal yet, but you know, very, well, very old. No, I mean, if you if well, if you get to be very, very old, you also get to live long enough to uh, the day that we achieve immortality. So as long as you get to live, uh, as long as you get that extension, you're also going to get the extension long enough to get to the immortality phase. So it's it's basically oh. equal to immortality, even if, even if you just extend it by like 500 years. Yeah. So anyway, speaking of immortality, it's time to wrap this up. Um, <laughs> Oh, that was what? a terrible segue. No, How is that a segue? No, no, no. <laughs> it's because, not. It's the anti-segue. No, no, no. It's, yeah. it's a good segue because we, 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 we're not immortal, p- probably. So we, we don't have unlimited time. That's there why you we have you to... interpreted better. <laughs> you interpreted my literal words really well there, in a way that I couldn't have foreseen. Uh, I, I, um, yeah. Habib, I talked uh, to Islam apologist. Yeah, go on. Yeah, it was a pleasure as always. It's just a lot of fun. I'd actually go on, but it's really, really late what's here on the Twitter, East Coast. What's, it, what's so. your Twitter handle again? Where can people find your Twitter? Uh, at, at Focus Break. You can find me there posting like food porn and sci-fi stuff and maybe ranting about video games. And I don't talk about all this stuff that's happened here, like like the ex-Muslim stuff. That's good. That's why we have uh, you here. That's, we have to come to Secular I, I think to it's good. Stuff. Yeah. That's I, I I think it's time now for ex Muslims to start like bringing in some of the other aspects of their personalities too, yeah. uh, like that. And that's that's why it's yeah, really that's, cool. That that's why we have you here, so that so that we get to get that that kind of content from you here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. sure. Why not? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, since we are, we're doing goodbyes and everything, closing off. Can I ask you guys a question? Yes. Yeah. Please do. Is there a time for this? Um, yeah. We might take another five minutes. Sorry, guys. It's okay. But. Hey, here's the thing that, uh, I mean, I've been writing this journal of mine and going to construct it into a book. Yes, and Ali, you are an inspiration of mine. Like, I want to write like something like the, the Muslim atheist, but about me <laughs> instead. But <laughs> right. I don't think I can finish the story yet because it's still being told. Like, there's still events that are happening. 
Now, one thing that I noticed with my journey on social media since 2014 till now is that part of it, I fell into a trap where I became as a, an outspoken critic of Islam. I sort of became a useful idiot to bigots mm. who just want to hate like on brown people and Muslims in general. Like, oh, she's wearing a hijab. She must be a terrorist. Right, that right. kind of person. How did you avoid that? Well, we you basically shit on their sacred cows as well. Easy. Yeah, I um, th th so this is something that I'm actually very conscious of, and we've talked about this quite a bit here. Uh, that you know, you you don't want to be co opted by because it's very important for me, especially now more than to just make a point to try and make a change. If I uh, if I'm lumped in with the crowd that is already an echo chamber, then I'm not really going to move out of it, but. I uh, what you do is you you talk about everything. I mean, I I talk about the reasons why, like I'm not going to dump one far right ideology because it's got all these like crazy far right ideas about women and gays and civil rights and free speech and science, and then move on to another one that has this exact same values. Uh, but well, hey, at least they're not chopping heads off. That's a bar, right? So um, so I I'm just uh, very very um, and it makes it easier now with the Trump era to be able to criticize uh, both sides. So but, I, I don't think but, people get me confused for an anti-Muslim bigot anymore. Well, and, and, uh, other than the people that want to want to do it on purpose because they have a different agenda, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. But but the thing is that one thing that I suggest uh, a lot of people say like, oh, we don't want we we want to lose the far right followers that we have, and sometimes we. Um, we basically shit on their viewpoints and tell like anti bigotry, anti racism. I mean, I go as far as like uh, even being against all form of nationalism. So even for some people that are not far right, uh, that's even too extreme, right? Um, so and even when it comes to, in fact, when I go as far as being extremely against Islam, but also too extreme sympathetic towards Muslim fundamentalists and even terrorists because I see them as a victim too sympathetic to them for even some left-leaning people right um so but this but the thing is that when it comes to um the idea that we need to lose them as a follower I don't agree with that because what I say is that if I'm not willing to give up on an you know, member of ISIS or an Al Qaeda or an Islamic fundamentalist. Why would I give up on a Nazi sympathizer or a neo-Nazi? Right? Like, I don't want to lose them as a follower. I mean, if they're never going to change their mind, I'd rather lose them as a follower. But the best outcome is that they follow me, and they change their tune. I mean, I we have been responsible for many Muslims including ISIS sympathizers to be an ex-Muslim atheist right now. If we have that results with, with those kind of people, why can't we have the same kind of results with people from the, from another, uh, you know, bo batshit, bullshit, crazy ideology? I don't, I, I'm, what I'm saying is don't, don't give up on people. I have noticed a lot of people that followed us, um, they, that followed us and said like, yeah, fuck all Muslims bomb the shit out of the Middle East, just drop an atom bomb on it. After a few years of following us or people like us, I've noticed that they're saying like, they yeah, change. Yeah. They change. Like, you know, I, I, I hate Islam. I don't hate Muslims. Some of them might be pretending, but some of them are not. Some of them are changing their tunes because of the, like, Hey, some of them didn't know that there's an option to actually be against Islam and not be against Muslim. They were introduced to the, they hated Islam. They thought automatically, well, if I hate Islam, I must hate Muslims, right? They were introduced to that option. Like, hey, I met, it's possible to hate an ideology and see the people of that ideology as a victim. I didn't know that was an option. I, I, I feel more comfortable not hating people. So I'm saying don't give up on people, introduce them to new ways of thinking. Yeah, just say exactly what you're saying. Say, you know, like mm -hmm. I, I know that a lot of us do this. Actually, I know Armin does it. I know I do it. A lot of people do is where they say that, you know, yes, this is a criticism we make, but the thing is that we do it because 
we are compassionate towards Muslims because we come from Muslim societies. We come from Muslim family, Muslim friends, and and all of that. And I, I that actually makes a huge difference. And and people don't really miss they don't miss that message. They do get it. Yeah. So, but all right. Yeah. <laughs> thanks for your answer. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah th thanks. I, no, thank so for this was here. fun. One reason you can tell that this was a lot of fun is because uh, we ended up uh, <laughs> all talking a lot. It was less an interview and more a conversation. I as honestly you wish out. I could talk to you like for another five hours if I. Yeah, man, that. you're you're just uh, really fun to have, and we're gonna we're gonna have you on again when, yeah. whenever we want to chill. You're my like uh, yeah. uh, go to chill. Like, okay, I, I just want to have a chill podcast and just relax and have a good conversation. Sure, why not? Can I come yeah. on your feed, uh, kebab and what's that? Kebab and Mars uh, podcast at some point. Kebab on Mars. Yeah. Sure, sure. We we can talk about mortality. Yes. Please. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. it'll be good. So cool. anyway. Anyway, thank, thank you, you everybody. Time. Thanks. Go check yeah, out yeah, the every... podcast. Go check out the podcast. This guy is very smart, so this podcast is gonna be interesting. And this is a favorite topic of mine, by the way. Right. And yeah. I, I actually really, really enjoyed this time uh, the conversation that you and Armin had about uh the economic initiatives and the um, the vision to the 2030 and stuff. I think that we should probably excerpt that at some point and uh, put that out separately as well. Thank you I think that was a lot of very, very insightful. Razib, uh, Michelle, Mike, Mars. Uh, these are our patrons that join us on, on live chats. You guys are awesome because without you, we wouldn't be able to invest this much time and resources on this show. So thank you all for being our patrons. And if you're a patron, uh, try to come up on some of these live streams. I know we announced it last minute sometimes. I mean, I've always, so it's hard to catch these. But but we'll if once we become more free, we'll try to announce it more in advance. But thank you for any everybody that shows up here on on, on the right. live chat. Yeah, anyways, uh, I know Ali has to go. He's he's very late there. But thank you, yeah, thank, yeah, thank yeah. you. All right, thanks to be. I'll I'll talk to you guys. Thank bye you. Bye. Later, man. Bye. Yeah. The secular jihadists have been made possible thanks to the Illuminati and the covert support of Israel and the CIA. That's what we have been told, but we haven't received our checks yet. If you like what we do, please support us. Share the podcast with your friends. Write and tweet us with topic and guest suggestions. Or head over to secularjihadist.com and give a dollar or more for exclusive access to live video. Have your questions read and answered on the air and more. Till next time, may the flying spaghetti monster be with you.